feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminists we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Douglas Murray. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, the UK's counter-extremism czar has said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. President Biden warns that freedom and democracy are under attack at home and overseas in his State of the Union address. And the US is to build a temporary Gaza port to increase the flow of aid. All that and more coming up. But first, let's get the news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. The former Prime Minister Theresa May is to stand down at the next election after 27 years in her Maidenhead constituency. She says she wants to focus on other causes and it's been a difficult decision to make. Well, she became PM in 2016 after David Cameron and is probably known best for negotiating Brexit. Well, former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth told Talk TV that she'll leave a mixed legacy. It's a shame the public is led to believe that members of Parliament just in it for themselves. Theresa May was not. Most members of Parliament are not either. Uh, I think, though, unfortunately, uh, she got Brexit wrong. The Ministry of Defence is accused of not having a credible funding plan for the military equipment it needs. The Public Accounts Committee says it puts the country in an alarming place reliant on allies for protection. It found a £17 billion financial black hole and says the MOD is putting off painful decisions to deal with it. A well, former head of the British Army, Lord Dannitz, told us we need to spend enough to deter further aggression. The bottom line is we're not spending enough on defence now. If that continues and we get sucked into a ghastly war, that'll be disastrous for our finances. So we've got to be prepared to pay a larger premium to deter war. And that premium is around about two and a half to three percent. That's what the government has got to con confront. Joe Biden's confirmed plans to build a temporary port on Gaza's coast, but insisted there'll be no American boots on the ground. He says it'll help get larger ships into the region to deliver more humanitarian aid. And during his final State of the Union address before November's election, he also warned freedom of democracy are under attack. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. The NHS app is to be used by doctors to monitor people's step counts and offer therapy. It's part of a government plan to tackle unhealthy lifestyles and get people back into work. Well, the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, told The Times that the health service would make use of data from smartphones and wearable devices to help prevent serious illnesses. Head teachers in England say broken relationships between parents and schools is causing high levels of absence. About a fifth of pupils are persistently missing school, which means losing out on at least 10% of their lessons. Well, it'll be discussed in Liverpool later today, and the Association of School and College Leavers says some parents no longer believe in the importance of education. And drivers who hog the middle lane of motorways are being targeted by a national campaign with warnings they could face a £100 fine. National Highways says a third of motorists admit middle lane hogging occasionally, while 5% say they always do it. Well, the Highway Code says we should use the left lane unless we're overtaking. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. Well, it looks like we've got a fairly dry end to the week. We've even got some sunshine around, but it's not going to be warm. Temperatures not particularly high, and we've got this brisk easterly flow. Now, that's been hanging around eastern coast for much of the week, but those winds are going to pick up today, so those temperatures, which aren't high to start with, feeling considerably cooler and the winds will be strongest down towards the southwest over parts of Wales and to the lee of high ground as well as through the channel. Northern parts will fare somewhat better. But later on we see the cloud increasing from the southwest. That's going to bring rain into Devon and Cornwall, other southern counties and also parts of southern Ireland. Clear skies up towards the north and the west. So here we are likely to see a touch of frost overnight and again it is going to feel bitterly, bitterly cold with that easterly wind coming in. And then Saturday a bit of a different day. Still the best of the sunshine is likely over western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere we see an increase in cloud, showery rain making its way northwards. Then it takes a bit of a rest before we see further heavy rain starting to work its way up from the south. So there will be some sunshine around. Temperatures at best around 12 or 13 degrees Celsius but feeling colder in that wind. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Welcome back. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Today, we're asking about the UK's counter-extremism czar's comments where he said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. I want to know what your reaction is. Is he right? You can get involved in that discussion by texting on 8722, 8722, or tweet us on x at TalkTV. That's at TalkTV. Now, joining me now to run through all the top stories is former governor, government advisor Claire Pearsall and political commentator Esther Kraku. Thanks so much for being with me this morning. Look, let's start with this first story. Um, Esther, perhaps first with you. This is a pretty amazing splash, isn't it? On the front page of the Telegraph, the yeah. government's counter-extremism czar saying that London has become a no-go area for Jews. I, I think he was quite diplomatic in, in how he said it, because I would actually expand it to many pockets of the country are actually a no-go zone for Jews. And I think the pro-Palestinian protests have kind of take, like the, the cat is out of the bag now for many people that have actually ignored the fact that we're living with people in this country that are incompatible with British values. And I think it's an uncomfortable reality that we've had to face because we don't understand that it's actually possible for people to go out to the streets of the capital and shout anti-Semitic, hateful things and think, well, is this actually Britain? How is this possible? How are we living in 2024 and people are so brazenly doing that? And actually, it's the fact that we've ignored the, the, the reality that there are certain people living amongst our midst that are not buying into what it takes to actually live in British society, which is buying into British values. You can have political views, but when, once you tread into the territory of actually uh, advocating for the murder of someone just by virtue of, of their religion, their race, their identity, then you, you, are, you are stepping the line. And these people should never have even been here in the first place. But unfortunately, this is where we are. I mean, some of these businesses that are along the route of a lot of these pro-Palestinian pro protests, they, they are, they're having to close down on days when these protests are happening because they just cannot function because they're terrified for their own lives. There, there are young people in London that say, you know, I cannot wear my religious markings because I'm terrified that I'll be persecuted in London. And I suspect when you go to more ignored corners of the country, sort of in, in areas where communities are far more, even, even more self-isolating, it's probably probably just as bad. What do you make of this, uh, Claire? I think he's saying uh, out loud what has been known within the Jewish community now for some time, certainly for the last five months, that it, to be Jewish in London is spectacularly difficult and people are afraid. And yes, I, I, I do understand your point about extremism and people being allowed to, to do these protests and integration. And I think there yeah. is a wider conversation to be had about integration into the United Kingdom. A lot of the people on these marches are actually here we, when you sort of see some very white middle class Look. British people taking up the cause that they don't actually understand and they don't know what it is they're backing. Do you think they don't understand it? I do, actually. I think there is an awful lot of, we are going to take this piece of information, we see the humanitarian problem in Gaza, right. which is not a, you know, that is a reasonable position to hold. Do they understand what Hamas is? Do they understand what the rise of a terrorist group looks like? I'm not so convinced. But the thing is, those people, I don't, those people don't bother me as much because I, I don't think they have any sort of strong men, like, convictions behind what they're saying. So they're easily swayed. If you can be swayed in this direction, you can be easily swayed elsewhere. I'm talking about 
self-isolating groups in this country that foster and harbor these extremist views that are not That's... that are not acting because it's you know the core celeb or the, the, the sexy thing to, to advocate for. They genuinely hold these destructive, hateful views, and they are they are existing in enclaves in this country, and they haven't integrated or bought into the idea that actually when you're in Britain you accept British values. But I think the problem is that yes, there are those groups, absolutely, and they don't speak English because there's no need to. Uh, they can go to the doctor and the dentist and the shop on the corner and speak in their own language because that has been allowed to, to happen. But I think we have to be really careful at demonising everybody from a certain community mm. in with those who hold those extremist views. And that is what has unfortunately been happening in the United Kingdom, that everybody that happens to be of the Muslim faith has now been charged with that brush. Do you think they have? I, I really do. Well, you've seen it. The amount of Islamophobia that we have seen on the streets of London. Where's that? Outside the Houses of Parliament. The thing, the thing is, 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 is Islam. I've seen. Islam I, I, I think you read. Uh, what is it? Anti, I have seen anti other. Muslim. Oh, well, the yeah, thing is, yeah. but the thing is, if you if you look at the biggest critics of of these kinds of where the, the hotbeds of these extremist ideology come from, the biggest critics are actually other like moderate Muslims yeah. because a lot of social and this is not necessarily a religious issue, but if you look at a lot of social data, actually these views are coming from groups of people that have actually not integrated properly into the United Kingdom. Many mm -hmm. of them can't drive. Many of them, you know, ha don't adopt. Well, can't speak the language, many of them are able to coexist or have parallel lives amongst other communities yeah, yeah. Other, that, that are not necessarily white British. You can, they can, they tend to uh, coexist alongside, you know, uh, black Asian, uh, black African community, uh, well, black British communities, but well, African British communities, yeah, yeah. Caribbean, all of that. So these are the kinds of groups that actually, you know, we, we need to be discussing why, why these ideologies are allowed to exist and foster within these communities. But and I don't think that's necessarily, necessarily no, 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 down and, to and religion, I think it, but it, it doesn't matter. I think religion plays a part of it. Yeah. And, I, and I think that um, places of worship across the country need to look at extremism course, yeah. and they need to be a little bit more savvy as to what is happening within those communities and, and to call it out you know, and be I mean, yeah, absolutely be bolder at calling it out. It's, it's strange. I, I, some of this discussion feels like uh, just a time warp to me. <laughs> I mean, we had this discussion about fundamental British values 20, 20 years, years ago. ago. And when Blair said it. When Blair <laughs> said in 2005, the rules of the game are going to change. Yeah. Gordon Brown, I remember him. Uh, spent a lot of time, actually, to his credit, talking about, you know, fundamental British values and this sort of thing. How are we 15, 20 years later and we're still having this discussion? Because we've ignored it, uh, because we've allowed ourselves to be stifled by people that are unwilling to, uh, are not mature enough to actually have, to engage yeah. in this conversation. We've allowed ourselves to be silenced by people that are, are wanting to shout racism or discrimination or, or whatever at every corner. The reality is we all have to live together and we all have to have a set of values and ideals and an identity that bind us together. If you are unwilling to take part in that discussion, you need to leave. And we should have said that for a very long time. I don't care where you go, but go where you are more comfortable because you cannot live in British society and not buy into certain British values. But, that was the, but, it. Never get to, got to the bit where you need to leave. But yeah, but, but well, well, Esther. I mean, look, this 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 country has spent years now trying to keep one girl who joined ISIS yeah. out of the country, and it has taken up endless yeah. hours in the courts and so on. And that's. That's somebody who joined ISIS, yeah. you know. I mean, I know that she says she sort of didn't know what she was getting into, she was and she groomed, thought she was yeah. going on a holiday and didn't. Yeah. I mean, we can all we can all accidentally join a head hacking uh, jihadist group accidentally. Of course. I'm sure yeah, it's yeah. happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that's <laughs> with an abs that's with an absolutely clear cut case. Mm. I mean, I mean, what we're talking about here is people who seem not to sign up to British values, as we now call them, and much more. But what on earth do you do with them? But the problem is that we can't have a conversation about it. Well, we're three of it us now. Are, yeah, well, well, the three of us are having a balanced conversation. Unfortunately, you take that outside, you take it into Parliament, it goes horribly wrong. Yeah. yeah. That kind of conversation goes bad. Okay, now why is have, that? But hang on, but why is that? Why is that? I think there is a lot of pressure but behind some MPs. I think that has a part to play in it. I think also just the, the sheer subject. People want to be very careful with what they say, so they end up saying nothing at all, with a lot of words to say nothing, as we've seen from a lot of politicians. But also, nobody wants to call out the behaviour, extremist behaviour, on both sides of the spectrum. Well, where are the both sides of that, though? Because I hear this a lot. I heard this in the Rishi Sunak speech last yeah. Friday. He kept on talking about both sides of it. Look, we all recognise that if, if it is the case, as a, even the counter-extremism advisor to the government has said, that, it, that London is basically a no-go zone for Jews, 
Well, we know what's driving that. It's a, it's a hardcore, mm -hmm. very, very driven Muslim ideologues on the streets, some of whom openly support Hamas, yeah. which is a prescribed terrorist group. And then, you, as you say, there are the people coming along with them, some of whom don't know what they're chanting. And one video of one of the guys the other day at the protest is this white, sort of sandal-wearing young guy. Yeah. And, he, and there's somebody said, what does your banner mean? And he said, oh, I don't really know. And they said, well, well where did you get it? Oh, that guy over there gave it to yeah. me. I was like, what? Yeah. Who yeah. goes down the street with a banner that just some other bloke's given them? Anyhow, those people aside, nevertheless, you said both sides of it. Where is the other side? Like where is that? Where is this? Where is, where is this? Side? Where is this kind of far right them, thing? Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. We know that there are pockets of like there. There are like very nasty people in the woodshed. We know that with the murder of Joe Cox. Yeah. But there's no organised movement on the other well, side, is the, there? The thing is, they're so well, they're so small, they're negligible. That's there are both sides. But the, the reality is, you if you if you give equal weight to the, the the kind of the other side when when we don't necessarily see it on the data unless you're like following bots on Twitter it, it makes it seem like you're unserious about tackling the issue and the politicians want to seem balanced they want to seem like oh yes we're saying we're, we're giving the we're, we're yeah. wagging our finger at all the naughty kids right yeah, yeah. but but the thing is we know the writing on the wall we can actually see in our daily lives that actually one group one side far outweighs the other and in orders of magnitude to almost to render the other side insignificant but I do think it's also about organization. Well, yeah. And I don't think necessarily that a far right organisation, you know, of which there are a few, they're not as organised. And I think it is the sheer number of people coming out on the street. It is the volume at which they are speaking and yeah. the problems that they are causing in certain areas. And you tend to forget then all of those other groups on the other side. My, my son goes to school in Dover and Doverport obviously gets a lot of attention with the migrant crossings, mm -hmm. and you get an awful lot of those far-right groups protesting within the town. When it's you... not advertised as much on the press. Is it it far, isn't is that far as right large though, number. Or is that... Because uh, that's the thing, what does yes, far, well, far right mean? Well, yes, so, yes but the thing I is, really even, is. If, even if it was, I don't know, me and my relatives, right? You know, Black West African British people on the coast of Dover saying actually we don't want these these boats coming across because we don't these are unvetted mainly young men. Does that make us far right? I no, mean it that doesn't. But they are um, belonging to a group which they are very proud to to say when they're out on the street. And which group is that you're talking? about? It, it is the EDL. Mm. And they have had banners out there. And you know, and this is where I'm going to get you know a load of people sort of saying, well, they've perfectly you know allowed to express their views. Absolutely, they are, but they're not allowed to go and intimidate a group of teenagers well, in a town centre. Yeah. No, yeah, sure, that, that's, I mean, that's everyone's agreed true. on that. But I mean, you know, you, we have, as I say, tens of thousands, sometimes yeah. hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of London every week and who are, what I mean are intimidating yeah. people. Yeah. And they actually are, as Esther said, they're, they're closing businesses. If you have a business in Oxford Street, your main trading day every week, the Saturday, your business yeah, is wrecked. Yeah, exactly. I mean, business some of them are actually yeah. closing the shops. Anyhow, I mean, I, well, we must move on, but I, f I find this kind of on the one hand, on the other with oh, this. Yeah. You know, the risks are not the same. And uh, even the government's uh, prevent reviewer, he said that. He said that the other month mm -hmm. and he delivered his review. He said, he said, there is a threat from the far right, there is a threat from the Islamists, but they are not of the, the same, same scale. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, look, moving on, uh, you might have noticed uh, that last night uh, President Joe Biden gave mm. his State of the Union address. Uh, let's just have a quick clip from that now. Now it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. What did you make of this? No, it's... All right, let's just put to one side the general health of President Biden. I think there are some really important points that he makes, especially when he looks at uh, Ukraine and Russia. And if we don't continue to help Ukraine, then that puts Europe at risk. And I do think that this is a really valid point, mm -hmm. that we cannot stop supporting Ukraine against Russia. But I think, you know, America has a lot of skin in the game with this. They are not blameless. And it's very nice to go preaching from the safety of the United States when I'm not seeing the negotiating power of America 
solving any problems. And that's what they've always put themselves there to do, is yeah. to negotiate and to be a peacekeeper. And it isn't working. Well, the, the whole world looks at Biden, Americans at home, the, everyone else abroad, and we just see weakness. It's just mm. weak, a weak man. And a weak man in a scary world is even scarier because ev then everything is at, is, is at risk. I don't think this whole shtick of democracy being attacked, that's, that's been a de Democrat line for years now. That was the line that, that, that effectively yeah. um, brought him the White House. It's no longer working because if this is what this, if this is what democracy not being under attack looks like, I'd rather go back to, to Trump. That's but what many know, people are thinking. But, but let me just throw one thing out there, because I, I was struck, whenever I see a State of the Union address by uh, Joe Biden, mm. in fact, whenever I see him give an address, pretty much, if he gets through the whole thing, everyone says, well, it's all, yeah, it's exactly, all right. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, my point <laughs> is, is that, in a way, Republicans in the US and elsewhere, and his critics, which he's, he's got a lot of at home and abroad, um, they, they make it so, they emphasise so much his inability to just get through things, his stumbling, yeah. his fumbling. I'd argue Joe Biden's always been like that uh, through decades yeah. as a senator. He was famous, famous, and as Vice President Obama said this, famous for sort of rambling on, losing his train of thought. Yeah. That's sort of, that's Biden at his peak. So when people say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a tricky, it's been a tricky period, he's deteriorating and much more. Don't you think that like this, people like you, Esther, when you say this, you, you talk it up so much that if he just gets through the speech, if he just reads the auto cue, yeah. he's like, well, actually, he's all right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no getting around the fact that this is an old doddering man and he's clearly not very impressive. He doesn't walk into a room and command it. I think the main focus should be on the content of what he yeah. manages to get out to say if he, if he manages mm -hmm. to, to, to form coherent sentences. That's what worries me. Because even if you had a doddering old man that was actually saying something that connects with, with the average American person and makes them even, even feel like they're remotely aware of what, what they're going through, that would be a lot better. But for him to just say vague platitudes like, oh, our democracy is under attack. It's a, it's well, a really convenient headline exactly. to have. It's, but it's also empty and it's meaningless. But, and, I, and some of the really important things that he did say were at the end and not very many people have covered. And it's, it's talking about overturning Roe v. Wade yeah. judgment that, that had gone through the courts. And I think things like that are really, really important. What it does unfortunately happened though is it, it's got buried under this sort of rhetoric and the headline grabbing of you know democracy is it threat and we must do better and you kind of think well you've been president now for some considerable period of time why, 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 why now yeah. do you why think, now are you putting all of this effort into it and do you think Claire, that the, the uh, picking up things like roe v wade i mean that was the, the, that mm -hmm. supreme court judgment on on abortion in the us uh, that actually did have a huge impact on the republicans yeah. in the midterms um, do you think that's still going to be a galvanising issue at the presidential election in November? Yeah, I absolutely do. I can't see that people are going to let this go. When you've mm. got states where it is illegal, you've got people then going to... Illegal to, to have an abortion. Illegal to have an abortion. And also now looking at the fact that IVF is considered in some states to to be against the Constitution, to be against everybody's human well, rights. I even mean, even fertilising eggs is now... Yeah. Is now um, a, and I find but, this just sort of... This grinding down of women's rights in America land of the free to be appalling. And I think that women aren't going to let that go. Strong women especially aren't going to let that go. And but it will be is, a it, big issue. It, it, it ma it, what matters is how it will play out electorally. So yes, it's an important issue, but for who? And who, yeah. who is it going to be a top issue for? I mean, are really urban, sort of elitist, educated white women going to change the vote to Republican on based on any other issue, right? They're already, they're already Democrat voters. He's already they're, got them in ex the back. Exactly. The people that will care about Roe v. Wade are already Democrat voters anyway, the, the vast majority well, of them. So I don't know if it's enough of an issue to swing the pendulum. Well, let I'm me just get on, let me get on an issue that might swing the pendulum for them. The Democrats uh, are also, of course, coming under some pressure domestically over the president's attitude towards the Israel-Gaza war, the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, he did say in the State of the Union last night that the US is going to uh, build a port to increase aid to Gaza. Is this the sort of thing that you think is going to satisfy the Democrat base? I think this is some really, really dangerous ground, in yeah. fact, huh. because I, President Biden has always said there would not be American boots in Gaza. Well, they're However, not going to be on the ground. No, they're they're going, going to be on going the to port. Build a pier. Yeah, they're going to be on and the pier. Boots on the pier. It, it feels a little bit like he's failed in every other way. This is the only way that he can make some difference. I, this, I this, is also, this is also a massive failure because he's undermining an uh, ally. He, yeah, he absolutely is. Well, and I don't see what he is. I mean, yeah, OK, humanitarian aid needs to get in. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But building a pier, 
putting American troops out there, this feels even more inflammatory. As, as you say, it goes against the, the advice of all your allies. What is and this going to achieve? And also, the optics, the optics are terrible because having to seeing people running, seeing these Gazans yeah. running into the ocean, trying to get like sort of aid boxes, it's a t it's terrible optics. And apparently, this this port is going to be operational in a couple of months. So now there's mm. a question mark. What about this great ceasefire? You were you or this the yeah. humanitarian pause he was touting? Is that not going to happen now if this is going to be operational in a couple of months. How long is the fighting? Are you expecting the fighting to last? Which I mean, goes back to exactly. my point and, about and then the, the You're also un undermining your position or well, his support for Israel because on the one hand, you're supporting them, but you're undermining them by yeah. effectively circumventing um, them and saying they're frustrating humanitarian aid efforts, so we're going to go around them, but we're still supporting them. It's a completely haphazard yeah. I, policy. I have to, I, and I agree with Claire. I mean, there, it is, it's very interesting for a president who has prided himself on not getting American troops mm. involved yeah. in foreign conflicts. You know, the amazing thing about this is, I mean, they've done airdrops of aid, there is a significant amount of aid still going into Gaza. But uh, the amazing thing about this is, of course, that the minute you do actually put American troops, any troops, mm. anywhere, even peacekeeping troops, of course, yeah. They can only go in to a theater of operations if they are able and willing to fire. Yeah. Yes. And this, this is one of the things that's very, very striking to me about this, you know, because we saw the other day with one of the aid trucks that went in, Hamas ended up, or quite often just nicks the aid trucks and takes it for themselves. Uh, there was a big shooting incident still are being argued over, but it seems that Hamas opened fire on some of the civilians, maybe some civilians opened fire. If you put American troops into yeah. Gaza, even a few feet in, even on, in, the, uh, in the water, as yep. you say, Esther. Um, if, if you have people flooding towards American troops and if some of those people are threatening danger in any way, then those troops are going to have to fire. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's completely... But again, this, this goes back to the overarching point of Biden's presidency, which is weakness. Weakness and inconsistency. And unfortunately, you cannot, people are not going to tolerate that for much longer. You cannot say, oh, but just tolerate that, deal with my weakness and inconsistency mm. because democracy is under threat. I'm sorry, yeah. the other guy looks like a better option. Thank you, uh, Esther. Look, we're going to have to go to a break, but coming up, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has refused to rule out a May election. And we hear today that former Prime Minister Theresa May is standing down at the general election. I'm Douglas Murray. And you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. It was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has refused to rule out a May election. The PM had previously mentioned that his working assumption was an election in the second half of the year. However, he's since failed to repeat that formulation. And we also hear today that former Prime Minister Theresa May will be standing down at the general election. I'm pleased to say that joining me now is political columnist at The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh. Welcome, Trevor. Great to be with you. Good morning, and welcome back from the battlefield. Thank you very much. On to another <clears throat> one. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think there is going to be an election in May? Is it going to be ruled out? What do you foresee? Well, if Rishi won't do it, I think I can rule out an election in May. Um, having been very firmly steered away from that idea at the weekend, uh, because there are a number of things that want to be that uh, Rishi Sunak wants done before calling the election, mainly getting the economy visibly improving in such ways as uh, lower interest rates, lower mortgage rates, lower inflation, and with luck, a uh, lower uh, bank rate. So <clears throat> all of those things are going to take time. And I'm not sure that the budget went down as favorably as they might have hoped. So I think you can pretty well um, forget about May of the 2nd. And do you think, I mean, this is all about just putting off the inevitable, isn't it? I mean, whether it's May, whether it's November, and the Tories are toast. I'm afraid that's true. And I think they know this, not just in the party at large, which has basically given up the ghost, and in the Tory party in the House of Commons, but in Downing Street too. They cannot be unaware of the fact that, you know, 20% in the polls is a catastrophe and that it's irreversible. The mood has now set in, and I think that what we've known in the past is that the result of a general election is usually known or f formed in the minds of the voters about six months out. We are now about six months out, and I think the, the mind is made up, uh, the voters' minds are made up, and we are going to see a heavy defeat. I mean, I think that the polls will narrow a little towards the actual election day as the campaign gets into way and people start looking a bit more closely at the Labour Party under Keir Starmer, which is profoundly lacking in any significant policies of any sort, economic, uh, military, domestic, uh, social and welfare. It hasn't put any, uh, any actual uh, detail into any of those areas. So uh, at the moment, what we're seeing is not a, a support growing for Labour, but a total desertion from the Tory ranks. Well, you said, uh, Trevor, that it's irreversible. And, I mean, I, I, I would tend to agree, but these, as I often say, are pretty long years uh, uh, at the moment, and an awful lot happens in one. Do you foresee anything that could happen in the next six months that could in any way change around the Conservative Party's fortunes? Well, I can tell you that I have been present during conversations with Conservative MPs about whether or not it's still, it's now too late to dump Rishi. I mean, that hasn't gone away. And frankly, I think the only thing that could change the dynamics of this situation would be under a new leader. But we've seen five Conservative leaders in eight years, and it's gone down, not up. It's very difficult to imagine anyone suddenly taking the reins of this runaway horse and bringing it back to an even sort of keel. It's, it's just uh, out of control. And I think that an awful lot of Conservative voters are simply fed up with the failures, disappointments and broken promises of 14 years of Conservative Party rule. But, you know, um, Trevor, we've also just heard this morning that Theresa May is going to stand down uh, as an MP at the next 
election, perhaps not surprising. Uh, she's been in, in Parliament since 1997, and uh, she's also, of course, uh, herself had a had a crack at being Prime Minister. But but it, it just I'm amazed when you say that there's serious conversations in the Conservative Party about dumping Rishi Sunak because. I mean, does the Conservative Party think that the country has an endless appetite for Tory wars? And isn't, isn't part of the problem that the Conservative Party base uh, keeps on giving the country, um, well, let me put it politely, duds? Well, this is unfortunately the case, and that's why I think that uh, there is this feeling that um, anything's better than what they've got at the moment, but that is not the case. I don't think there's any patience left within the... Uh, voting public, particularly within the Conservative Party, which is now across the nation sitting on its hands and waiting for something to happen. But they're not expecting anything now. It's too late. We are in the run-up to a general election. Another change of leader would simply portray the party as being utterly desperate and in a state of terminal chaos. So there's nothing there, and I don't think that there's any likelihood of Rishi Sunak doing anything dramatic during the remaining months of his premiership. Well, one final question, if I can, Trevor. Uh, I mean, you've you've uh, covered a lot of elections. I don't want to embarrass you by saying how many, but uh, you've, you've covered a lot. Uh, um, in your view, uh, are we talking uh, in the election this year about a Conservative wipeout on the scale of 1997, or is this like uh, the death of the Liberal Party about 100 years ago? It's very difficult to say. I, I, there's never been a situation quite like this. And uh, the advent of social media has distorted all the normal sort of mm. uh, guidelines that we would have followed back in the 70s and 80s. We are in a different world, a different landscape. And it's so easy for people to pick up on the sort of conspiracy theories, uh, the failures. Uh, nobody's looking at any of the successes of the conservative years, and um, there are good reasons for that. Um, so uh, I think that it, it, it could easily turn into a, a complete uh, uh, landslide for Labour. <clears throat> but on the other hand, uh, people who are much more expert in the way that polls work have told me that they've seen this before with Labour apparently leading right up to the election and then finding that they've lost or that the majority is much smaller. I think that's a bit on the optimistic side. Thank you very much. Trevor Kavanagh, columnist at The Sun. Great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, still with me are Claire Pearsall and Esther Kraku. Um, let me start with you, Claire. Um, Trevor just referred to the successes of the Conservative years. Uh, I think he said it with a slight uh, hint of irony. But if, if, you, if you could put your finger on any successes of the Conservative years, what would you say they are? OK, I mean, this will be the most controversial one, which is the Brexit referendum. Hmm. It was the one thing that the Conservative Party have always had an issue with was Europe. Mm -hmm. It is the one thing that it has always promised to mm. solve for its voters. Now, whether you agree with the results or you don't, and, uh, you know, we can have that argument another day. We haven't had it at all in recent years, have we, though? No, no, no it's no. been really quiet for the last <laughs> yeah, nearly eight <laughs> years. Um, we've not heard a word of it. No. Um, but I think that was the one thing that they promised. It's the one thing they, they delivered. Mm. Yes, it's divisive, but the mm. Conservative Party have always had that issue. It wanted mm -hmm. sovereignty. Its voters wanted sovereignty. That's what it gave them. But I also think that there were some real missed opportunities with the um, premiership of David Cameron when he first came in talking about his big society. This is in 2010 or this 2015? This was in 2010 yeah. when he came in. When he came in, in coalition. Awkward coalition. Yeah. But when you sort of strip back what it was, the big society was pretty bold. It was not very well um, described to anybody if you, and, and that's always your problem. If you haven't got a political philosophy that you can put down into, into a couple of sentences, you've lost it. But essentially he wanted people to take responsibility. He wanted work to pay more than being on benefits. Mm. And it was all of those really good conservative values. But unfortunately the party is now sort of ripping itself to pieces, forgetting the real basics of what a Conservative is. Well, let's just yeah. pick that up quickly, Esther, because I mean, I, I agree that this, uh, if you consider what the Conservatives were talking about when they first came into office in mm -hmm. 2010, albeit in coalition, and you come to 2024. Yeah. Now, just let's take two, two issues. One is the issue of work. Mm -hmm. uh, we see major cities like Liverpool, Manchester, where one-fifth of the people who are capable of working 
Yeah. This isn't on disability benefits. Mm -hmm. This is people who are fit and able to work are not working. Yeah. Then you take the other issue. We remember back to 2010 when uh, David Cameron told the country that we were going to go back to tens of thousands of people a year, net migration, as we were in the 1990s before the Labour government. And he said, instead of hundreds of thousands, we'll have tens of thousands. Last year, historic net migration, yep. nudging up towards one million in a year. What happened? It's like two different parties took, took over. And in a way, two different parties did take over because there was... There was a party that had some sort of ideological, uh, uh, I don't know, conviction. And there was a party that was just, you know, managed decline, basically. The party of managed decline, let's, let's call it that. And unfortunately, there hasn't been any kind of long-term thinking. I think one of the, the problems the Tories have had is they're, they're, they're a victim of, victims of the establishment. They haven't been able to actually think long-term. One, because they don't have any kind of ideological conviction, but also they're scared of their own shadows. They're scared of Twitter. They're scared of, you know, mm, being called yeah. names by, by not even their own peers or, or fellow uh, uh, sort of voters by, by people online, yeah. Yeah. by people who write, you know, columnists, uh, column articles and all of um, well, by columnists, basically, of new newspapers. Um, so that's been the, the major issue. I mean, we've seen it, of course, with immigration, which is a massive issue. But I think the biggest, the biggest sort of policy failure that I've seen personally is energy. I mm -hmm. just cannot believe the, the yeah. complete lack of foresight of British, Brit Britain's energy policy. Yeah. It is, for me, it is the most astounding because it, it, it's rooted in so many things. It, it you know, it, it discourages investment. It affects yeah, yeah. You know, the average person. It, for me, that has been the biggest failure of the last 20 years. Of, well, of, of, of I mean, let me put up the example is uh, Nick Clegg. There's a video of him saying back in 2010 yeah. that if we nuclear. did build another nuclear plant, it wouldn't come online until 2023. Yeah. Who could imagine 2023 ever coming around? Exactly. Very but quickly, I, whilst I've got you, yeah. sorry. I was just going to say, but that is, I think that's a problem with governments. It yeah. doesn't matter that, what that, colour they the are, because yeah. it's the difficult and expensive, and they don't want to make those decisions. Um, quick, 30 seconds. Uh, Theresa May mm. leaving uh, the Commons. Are you going to miss her? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm really quite sad about that. Mm. Um, I think she is one of those most dedicated people. She didn't run off when she stopped being Prime Minister. Absolutely. She went to the back benches and she's stayed working for her constituents. And, you know, it will be a sad, sad day when she goes. Esther, do you agree? Yeah, and she's, uh, absolutely. And she's one of the few um, MPs that is almost universally loved by her constituents. I mean, everyone, yeah. can say, whether they agree with her, her, her positions or not, they say this is a hard-working, dedicated, dutiful woman and politics has lost a great, a great person. Yeah. And uh, in Inspired? Well, inspired yeah. by, by her own... Claire, there was a big pause there. Yeah. There was a it's big inspired pause. Inspired by her own philosophy. I don't know if it was very conservative. Look, at the end of the day, she, yeah. she is. She had her own distinct style and character. And I think that's exactly yeah, it. Exactly. She danced to her own tune and it was always service for Theresa May. And I think that more politicians need to remember that this is about duty and service. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. But um, I'm struck by your um, obituary-like hair. <laughs> Very, very respectful, yeah. like respectful silence. Anyway, coming up, US President Joe Biden's overnight State of the Union address sets out plans for the military to build a temporary port in Gaza. We'll be discussing that and much more. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh. Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just... yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Joe Biden made his pitch to American voters overnight, declaring that freedom and democracy were under attack both at home and abroad. His State of the Union address was a broadside to his predecessor and to President Putin. There was also his ally, Israel, over the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza as he confirmed plans to deliver aid via the sea. Now, joining me live from Jerusalem is Israeli government spokesman Avi Hyman. Avi, thanks so much for being with us. What's your reaction to the comments that the United States president made in his State of the Union address last night? Douglas, thank you so much for having me on and thank you for your ongoing moral clarity. Um, I can tell you that uh, we welcome the move. We welcome the ability to get aid to the Gazans that, that need it, not to Hamas, not to uh, have a scenario um, like, the, like the one we've seen where uh, Hamas can just loot and steal the aid. This isn't really that different when you think about it. It's not that different to our ally, um, the United Arab Emirates, opening up a, a, a hospital, a boat hospital, um, to serve the civilians that needed care. So uh, we will we will welcome uh, any way to get humanitarian aid to those that desperately need it. And like I said, to avoid it going into the hands of Hamas, who are trying to destroy us. But what is it that the Americans could do if they set up this extra port? What is there that they could do that, that isn't currently being done? Well, from a logistics point of view, from, from, from our perspective, we can get a lot more aid in. We've said to the international community for some time, bring the aid, we'll get it in. There's not an issue about getting aid into Gaza. The issue, rather, is to get aid to, to distribute around Gaza without it being stolen by Hamas. Um, so if there is a scenario by which um, a maritime uh, corridor can uh, logistically uh, work better, and we have uh, indications that that could be the case, um, then great. We, we don't have an issue with that at all. So where is Israel currently allowing aid to go into Gaza from? From Israel, obviously. From Egypt? So we, we've got it going in from the Kerem Shalom uh, crossing in Israel. We've, uh, we're checking at the Nitsana crossing uh, in Israel as well. And then from the Rafah crossing uh, in Egypt. We're up to a situation where we can check. You know, we've really upped our game. We, we um, hit a record of 277 uh, lorries or trucks going in uh, on one day this week. Uh, we can check security-wise, because obviously that's a massive concern. They're not bringing in weapons or, uh, or, 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 or things that could be used against us. We can check 44 trucks per hour. So the capacity is there. The, the ability is there. We also know there's a massive um, surplus on the Gazan side. There's about 200, as of yesterday, there's about 250 trucks worth of aid just sitting there, 
No one's doing anything with it. The UN, UN aren't distribu distributing it. They need to pull their finger out and distribute the aid where it needs to go without it going into the hands of Hamas. Now, you said there was somewhere between what, two and 300 uh, trucks a day going in. Uh, Lord Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, has just said that there need to be 500 aid trucks a day going into Gaza in order to prevent famine. Do you accept that figure? Absolutely not. The, the, this talk of, uh, of famine and starvation, we've actually heard it pretty much from day one. If you don't do this, there'll be starvation, there'll be famine. I don't see it. I mean, I see uh, pictures uh, being distributed by senior Palestinian uh, officials of uh, dying children, uh, emaciated children from the Syrian civil war. But I don't see uh, any famine. I see Gazans throwing out uh, aid because they don't want to take aid from the infidel. But I don't see uh, any imminent famine. As far as the number 500 is concerned, I'm not sure where that number comes from. It's thrown around that before the war, 500 uh, lorries went in a day. Well, that was 500 uh, lorries, including all kinds of things that we're definitely not um, allowing into Gaza now, building materials and all kinds of other things that can be used and weaponized against us. I can tell you that as far as food is concerned, more food is going in, you know, food, humanitarian aid, more is going in um, since the war started than went in before the war. So um, a lot of this is wildly exaggerated because people want to keep Hamas in power. They want an immediate ceasefire. And uh, we can't accept that because obviously, as you know, Douglas, that would mean October 7 again and again and again. That's not my words, that's theirs. Uh, well, let me, whilst I've got you, two very quick ones. Firstly, the, the talk that the ceasefire negotiations were postponed again uh, with Hamas uh, leaving the negotiations in Cairo. Is there anything else you can tell us about that? Well, Hamas, you know, our position hasn't changed uh, very much for over a week. Uh, Hamas is trying clearly to kick the can down the road because they want to stay in power, um, because they want to uh, try and turn this into uh, a situation revolving around Ramadan. This isn't this war has got nothing to do with uh, religion. This war is about our, our, our very uh, existence. We're fighting to survive another day as the Jewish state, and they want to eradicate us. They want to kill all Jews in Israel and all Jews around the world. That's what it says in their charter. And uh, very quickly, um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has just said that Israel will lose this war if it doesn't go into Rafah. Uh, what is it that, that is expected there in Jerusalem about the consequences, both regionally and internationally, if Israel does go into Rafa. Again, this is another issue that's been put on a pedestal. Um, we've taken out, as you know, 18 out of 24 um, Hamas battalions. There are four, we're currently fighting two uh, in Kanunis. Um, there are four left in Rafa. If we don't um, deal with those uh, Hamas battalions in Rafa, we won't win the war. Hamas will rearm, Hamas will go back to October 6th and continue on their path to destroy Israel. We can't allow that. It's, it's like someone would turn uh, to Winston Churchill in, you know, towards the end of the war and say, sorry, old boy, um, Berlin, no, you have to leave Berlin. The rest of Germany's fine, but just leave Berlin, you know, where all of the leadership is, where all of the power is, that's fine. You understand. No, no, Winston Churchill wouldn't understand. And as my prime minister has made it clear, we're not going to, our, our objectives are to destroy Hamas, to bring home the hostages, and to ensure that uh, Gaza does not pose a threat to Israel. We're going for total and full victory. We're not going to destroy half of Hamas, not three quarters of Hamas. We're going to destroy all of Hamas and return security to the south of Israel. Thank you very much, Avi Hyman from Jerusalem. Uh, still with me, I have Claire Pearsall and Esther Krakow. Esther, what did you make of what we just heard? Um, I think that... I understand, you know, the, the support for Biden's initiative. I think on a public policy level, it, it undermines his position and his support for Israel. Uh, but I understand from a, you know, it, it's not a good look for, for the Israelis who are managing aid going into Gaza to, to not support this. Um, but I have some questions about some of the things that the spokesman said, because he said at the peak of, 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 of you know, aid delivery getting into Gaza, the trucks being... Uh, Before the war. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. No, at the peak at the moment, during right. the war, the peak, they've managed about 250 trucks a day. Um, and even though Lord Cameron is saying they need 500 trucks, that means that for 2.2 million Gazans, that's one truck per... 11,000 mm -hmm. people, roughly, to carry food, medical facilities, fuel, drinking water, and other amenities. That doesn't sound like enough aid to me, just on you know rudimentary calculations. So I'm just thinking, you know, if that doesn't sound enough to me, and before October the seventh, 50% of Gazans, is estimated, were at, at risk of, of 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 starvation. 
I don't really see how you can tout that number as something being something sufficient. And also, my concern is, how long is this expected to last? Mm -hmm. Because if you have this port, which will only be operational in a few months, yeah. which, I, again, I don't really think that's politically coherent, is this going to go on for much longer? Mm. I mean, that's where, because people are, because I don't think the Israeli economy can stand this as well. Since October the 7th, the, the, GDP, the, the economy has shrunk by a fifth. I mean, this is unsustainable on both sides. You, you're wondering how many of these reservists, of Israeli reservists, that have had to leave their jobs, you know, how, how is the economy going to fill the gap with those yeah. people no longer in action? Yeah. yeah. This is unsustainable on both I, sides. Yeah, it absolutely is. And whilst I you know, fully support Israel's right to defend herself, and October the 7th was the most appalling atrocity, you now, we've moved on to what is going to happen in the future. And yeah, unfortunately, I don't hear very much coming out as to what the possible solutions are going to look like. We all want to have a ceasefire. We all want hostages to be returned. Goes without saying. We all saying, want Hamas to what, be destroyed. Absolutely. That, that's an unnegotiable. But the, the idea that people aren't dying of famine in Gaza, I think, is... Um, I think is wrong. I, I think there are people dying. I heard uh, a report from a UN special rapporteur on food this morning who said that there are people in the north of Gaza who aren't getting the aid coming through. Now, you can argue that this is Hamas not letting it through, but there isn't going to be enough, enough and yeah. on your calculations. So you can but see these, are, these are enough. rudimentary figures. And for me, at the end of the day, I don't think, actually, the, the IDF have the resources to completely, and the ability to completely get rid of Hamas unless they have co full control of the Gaza Strip yeah. for, for, for until the foreseeable future. Which then brings what, the question, what is it going what to is look it like? What look is this like? administration and, and going that's to look what like? I are they even going to want to do that? Let me throw one other thing there. Um, Benny Gantz, one of the ministers mm -hmm. in, in the uh, security cabinet, the war cabinet in Israel, said earlier this week that not going into Rafa is like putting out three quarters of a fire. Mm -hmm. um, I, you well, then the question, there's another question. Where do the people currently in uh, Rafa, where yeah. do they go? Yeah. Because, I mean, the, 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 uh, and again, you, you can talk about, you know, who should take them in, the Egyptians, the Jordanians. But I don't think there is a long-term, like, plan for that. Because you can't, you can't yeah. just put them somewhere no, you're right. temporarily. That's 2.2 million people. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. With no plan. Exactly. Thank you very much, both uh, Claire Pearsall and Esther Kraku. Now, we're going into the next hour, and I'll tell you that coming up, we will continue to discuss the UK's counter-extremism czar's comments where he said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. I'm Douglas Murray, and you are with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat all. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning, I'm Douglas Murray. You're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, the UK's counter-extremism czar has said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. President Biden warns that freedom and democracy are under attack at home and overseas in his State of the Union address. His speech comes as the US is to build a temporary Gaza port to increase the flow of aid into Gaza. And on International Women's Day, we speak to one woman who thinks the celebration is a big waste of time. All that and more. But first, let's get the news headlines from Nadira Tudor. Good morning. The firearms officer charged with murdering Chris Cabber has been named. Metropolitan policeman Martin Blake is facing a trial over the fatal shooting of the 24-year-old in South London in 2022. Blake appeared in the dock at the Old Bailey today to plead not guilty. His trial begins in October. Former Prime Minister Theresa May is to stand down at the next election after 27 years in her Maidenhead constituency. She says she wants to focus on other causes and it's been a difficult decision to make. She became PM in 2016 after David Cameron and is probably best known for negotiating Brexit. Political editor at Tortoise Media, Kat Nealon, told Talk TV many MPs are likely to follow Theresa May's lead. I think a lot of... Uh ministers current and former who are seriously questioning whether they stand now it's not just about whether they lose their particular seat but there is you know this recognition that they will be in opposition for at least five years mm. perhaps ten uh and having held a you know a great office of state the, the greatest office of state um do you really want to be in that position where it's it's so lacking in power the Ministry of Defence is accused of not having a credible funding plan for the military equipment it needs. The Public Accounts Committee say it puts the country in an alarming place, reliant on allies for protection. It found a £17 billion financial black hole and says the MOD is putting off painful decisions to deal with it. Former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth told Talk Today that the government needs to stop operating in the past. We have moved on from the Cold War. I mean, my generation dominated by the Cold War and defense procurement was basically um, really seeing the, meeting the Russians, getting ahead of them and each side matching the other. Today, we're in a war in Europe and what um, the, uh, the, the current government has recognized is that we need a whole new procurement model. Joe Biden has confirmed plans to build a temporary port on Gaza's coast, but insisted there'll be no American boots on the ground. He says it will help get larger ships into the region to deliver more humanitarian aid. During his final State of the Union address before November's election, he also warned freedom and democracy are under attack. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. 
Here in the UK, the government's commissioner for countering extremism, Robin Simcox, has warned that London has become a no-go zone for Jews every weekend. He says that last October's Hamas attacks on Israel will come to define our era and that ministers must be bolder and move faster in tackling all forms of extremism. And drivers who hog the middle lane on motorways are being targeted by a national campaign with warnings they could face a £100 fine. National highways say a third of motorists admit middle lane hogging occasionally, while 5% say they always do it. The highway code says we should use the left lane unless we're overtaking. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it looks like we've got a fairly dry end to the week. We've even got some sunshine around, but it's not going to be warm. Temperatures not particularly high, and we've got this brisk easterly flow. Now, that's been hanging around eastern coast for much of the week, but those winds are going to pick up today, so those temperatures, which aren't high to start with, feeling considerably cooler, and the winds will be strongest down towards the southwest over parts of Wales and to the lee of high ground as well as through the Channel. Northern parts will fare somewhat better. But later on, we see the cloud increasing from the southwest. That's going to bring rain into Devon and Cornwall, other southern counties, and also parts of southern Ireland. Clear skies up towards the north and the west, so here we are likely to see a touch of frost overnight. And again, it is going to feel bitterly, bitterly cold with that easterly wind coming in. And then Saturday, a bit of a different day. Still the best of the sunshine is likely over western parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, we see an increase in cloud, showery rain making its way northwards. Then it takes a bit of a rest before we see further heavy rain starting to work its way up from the south. So there will be some sunshine around, temperatures at best around 12 or 13 degrees Celsius, but feeling colder in that wind. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Today, we're asking about the UK's counter-extremism czar's comments where he said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. I want to know what your reaction is. Is he right? You can get involved in that discussion by texting on 87222. That's 87222. Or you can tweet us on X, at TalkTV. That's X. Uh, at, at Talk TV. I can never get used to calling Twitter X. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, joining me now to run through all the top stories is former government advisor Claire Pearsall and political commentator Esther Kraku. Thanks so much for being with me, uh, both of you. First of all, let's go to some uh, some of our callers, texters, tweeters, exers. Uh, what have you got, Esther? So Clyde says the UK has become unrecognisable these days. It's tragic. Uh, and Jake also said, I'd love to hear the reaction of the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. I'm sure he'd shoehorn the far right into it somewhere whilst blaming Brexit. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, yeah no, I don't doubt it. Claire? Uh, you've got Mark says, yes, most definitely London has become a no-go zone for Jews and UK citizens alike if you don't support Palestine. And then somebody, who was it? There's a, uh, Paul, who very, very, very funny. I like this one. Who said, then the UK's counter-terrorism czar admits he's not doing his job. Which is a Which good is point. An interesting well, point. Yeah, it's, it's a fair point. I, I think Paul is probably, you know, a little bit bang on the money on that. I wonder what he is expected to do. Mm -hmm. um, just, let's just go to that, uh, that point about the mayor of London, because it, this, this is really striking to me. Um, I was actually... I, I've, I've, I've got a long memory and a long uh, voting record of voting uh, uh, no to things that I think are going to make life in Britain <laughs> worse. And I remember oh, 25 years ago, we had a vote in London as to whether or not we wanted a London mayor. Most people don't remember this. But I voted no that we didn't. I'm told since that apparently there's lots of things the mayor can do that's made things better. Building regulations, apparently, it's much easier to do. But my ancient insight, mm. my ancient wisdom on this was as follows, that the more levels of government you have, the more people can avoid responsibility Absolutely. for anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say, and what your reaction is, I'd say that that applies nowhere more than with the police. 
Mm. Policing powers in this country. Everybody is saying that the Metropolitan Police have been getting these protests wrong, that from the beginning they've protested, they've been uh, policing them badly. They've allowed, as we saw, certainly in the first weeks, unbelievable things to be said, chanted and, uh, and raised on the streets of London. But... Who is actually responsible for the police? Uh, but I think that's that yeah. you've, you've, hit, you've touched on the second point as well. So more levels of government obviously mm. makes things more inefficient and clunky. But also, it, who's filling those gaps and those new levels that you've created? And it's usually people with very limited experience on the job. Mm -hmm. So you now have people being ushered into senior levels in the police force that don't actually have any on-the-ground experience. They've just, they have a, a degree from a university that says they can police in theory, but in practice, it's completely <laughs> different. And so you have all these kind of bureaucrats being shoehorned in because they have a sexy degree from an unknown former former polytechnic university. Did you say a sexy degree? Well, sexy, yeah, sex. Yeah. Oh, I have an M MA and this and that. And uh. then they get into the role, they have no practical experience. And they have all this jet and they're overpaid more than people with practical experience. Yeah. And so it's you, it's, 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 it's a, a kind of a double whammy. You have these, these unnecessary positions being filled by people with no experience. That's hmm. the problem. You, you agree? Do. And, I, and I think the police itself needs to be one entity and controlled by a body. And I think you're right. Nobody takes ultimate responsibility. If you look at the Metropolitan Police, you have the Mayor of London, you have police and crime commissioners, yeah. mm. and then notionally the Home Office. Right. And notionally. Um, who are in charge of policing and, strategy. And, and who of those... Because, you know, we hear of a Home Secretary calling in the Mayor, the Mayor calling in yeah. the heads of police. Yeah. Who actually is responsible for the Metropolitan Police? Well, okay. no, no one. I, I, it's, it's a giant clunking mess. You, you have, I mean, the Mayor of London acts as the Police and Crime Commissioner for the Metropolitan Police. So, therefore, Sadiq Khan, current London Mayor, would be mm. the one to be held responsible. But Sadiq Khan keeps, he, he keeps saying that it's not uh, uh, his responsibility. Uh, and, there's, no, and there's, there's your no issue. Of policing. And so. there is your issue, because you also have the Home Secretary who will be responsible in part for parts of mm. policing, and the chief commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, as the, the you know head honcho of the Metropolitan Police, ultimately should land on his shoulders. So you get into this really weird situation where you've got people in charge of bits of it and nobody wants to take responsibility for the entirety. And the people in charge of the bits of it have no experience with policing. Sadiq Khan doesn't know anything about policing and neither does the yeah. Home Secretary. So that's what... It, you have these layers of unnecessary government and then they're being filled by people with no experience. And, and this, okay, is, this is the problem. And, and you, you see that with the introduction of the Police and Crime Commissioner position, which I thought was a ridiculous idea when mm. it came out. There's another but layer. It is another layer, and it is people with absolutely pretty much zero responsibility and no of policing. no vision, because now we see community policing has all been gutted. Right, there's the yeah, I mean, I don't think that's a, the, the result of well, the police is, and crime commissioners. Well, but there is a result, because I mean, these people don't know what they're doing. Funding. No, they don't know what they're doing, but I think the, the problem is, is funding on that respect. But no, they don't understand the needs of policing. They've never been a yeah. serving police officer, and they don't understand what the community needs. But I, I tell you, one, one thing that absolutely mystifies me about the Metropolitan Police in particular is we have had these protests now for months. Yep. And by the, way, it, by the way, this isn't the same in other countries. I mean, whatever you think about the right to protest, and all that, the British public mm -hmm. do believe in the right to protest. So there's, uh, there's no doubt. All the polls show, you, you know, very, very wide-ranging support for this. We recognise it as, as we were talking about earlier, a fundamental British right. However, other countries don't allow this. Uh, France, which is, is not an uncivilised country, uh, the president banned marches from the beginning. He said, no, this is not, the streets of Paris are not to be shut down because of protests about uh, a war in the Middle East. Um, so other countries have raised that, but, it, but other than, I mean, aside from actually shutting down the protests, which I say is sort of not a very British thing to do, mm. the thing that amazes me is that we see the Metropolitan Police uh, week after week uh, sometimes being taunted by protesters, very often being, being uh, dealt with in a threatening manner by protesters. We see people who have undoubtedly broken the 2006 Terrorism Act by glorifying terror. And the police stand around and they seem to sort of take it. Now, whenever I speak to the police about this, I get told, well, our advice is to hold back. But here's the thing I don't understand. And it's true that they, they hold back and sometimes they go in and arrest people in the early hours of the morning and they forget, of course, that the British public and the public around the world do not see those early morning house raids. They do see people on our streets in front of Westminster Abbey, in front of the Cenotaph, defacing our public monuments and much more. But the thing that, that amazes me is this. A few years ago, during COVID, during mm -hmm. lockdowns, yes. the Metropolitan Police acted like a crack 
squad yep. against the British public. And some of us also remember that when there was a candlelit vigil mm. for Sarah Everard in London, mm -hmm. the police went in all batons blazing. I said uh, at the beginning of these protests when the uh, police seemed to have such trouble working out that if somebody was calling out jihad on the streets of London, they might be a wrong one. I, sa <laughs> I said, what, what, those, what those big bearded maniacs shouting jihad on the streets of London should have done uh, in order to get arrested by the police was to have a candlelit vigil, vigil. for a murdered woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Esther, what do you think? Well, I think one of the things is <laughs> the numbers are not on the Metropolitan Police's side. So obviously the numbers of the Palestinian protesters dwarf that of, of any vigil, any BLM protest. So, so the, the, the police can't throw their weight about there. But I actually think there's just been a reluctance to actually police the protests as opposed mm. to kind of managing and ushering them on. I absolutely believe in the right to protest. I think any, any British person does and should. Um, but you have to manage it because in the same way that we don't and we shouldn't tolerate, for instance, just up oil protesters gluing themselves to the M25 or, or defacing mm. public monuments and all of that, we shouldn't tolerate this either. If you know that something like this, which is very incendiary, is going to draw loads, cr huge crowds, you isolate them. You say, this is your space to do what you want. In this space, you can do whatever you want. We'll be around if anyone needs help. There must be a number limit because we cannot have such a large space that would accommodate people in their millions. That's ludicrous. And we don't have the resources for that. Look at how much this is costing. I know, but mm. I think if they'd done it right from the start, if they had removed offensive banners, if they had removed people who were chanting from the river to the sea, yeah. which is offensive, and projecting things onto the House of Commons, if they'd done that right from the start and said, we aren't going to tolerate any of this, you are allowed to protest, you have the right to protest, anything that is supporting a prescribed um, organization, anything that is is going to be offensive and is um, going to cause alarm, it is it has to be stopped. The, the law, they have the laws there to do it. It's not as if that you need any more legislation. Yeah, you I, don't. Well, You've I've got it. The police just need to actually do their job. And if they'd done it right from the start, we wouldn't be in this mess now. We'll move on to Rishi Sunak in a moment, but I just want to throw one other thought out to you about the police. We had the news this week that police in the UK solve no burglaries in yeah. half of the country. I just want to read that out again, just in case anyone <laughs> missed that or thought I had misread my cue. Absolutely, you heard it right. In half of the country, the British police solve zero burglaries. So when, Esther, you say the cost of policing these protests, yeah. I mean, I mean... This is actually something that costs everyone. Well, exactly. It's, ex it's, ex it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe the lack of foresight of, of, of the people in charge of these institutions. Because this is, again, this harks back to the point. There are people in charge that don't know what they're doing. There are too many layers of government to have these people that don't know what they're doing take responsibility for the fact that they don't know what they're doing. And this is a prime example. Mm. At the end of the day, you, you, you cannot justify having let these protesters get to, protests get to where they are. Yeah. When like half of burglaries are not being solved, I mean that's ludicrous. There was a, there was a, there was a case I wrote about recently. There was a, a woman who uh, was burgled at her house in St Albans, and uh, she had CCTV of the burglar, okay. and the police were not interested. And one reason the police weren't interested is there is no police station in, in St Albans, Albans. Yep. and that is a story that you hear up and down this country. Yep. That the old idea that you just oh well report it to the police. Uh, try to call the police, good luck mm -hmm. to getting a response. Yes. Try to find a police station, you can't find I one. I think the closest one is Hatfield. I mean, I live in that area. I sort of live in the kind yeah. of North London, St Albans, Hatfield, Barnet area. Um, yeah, I think the only one is, uh, now thinking about it, uh, Barnet and Hatfield. Those are the two closest police stations, which are uh, just like 20 minutes away. I, I live out in, in the countryside, the glorious Kent countryside, and I live in a low-crime area, but people have car crime. There is, mm. yeah, yeah, there yeah. is a, you an can't absolute get insurance on a Range Rover now. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is things like that that police just give you a crime reference number, tell you to go sort it out with your insurance company, and, and that's your. One lady was told to nick her car back. Yes. Because she what? had a tracker that. on it. Yes. Yeah, so I've she heard reported that with the her car stolen, yeah. but she had a tracker on it, so she knew where it was. And the police told her, yeah, go nick it back. Yeah, and it's like, but if you have a knife, stay back. And the same with bicycles. Park. Somebody, uh, somebody locally has had seen their bicycle that had been stolen, was advertised on a, a, a social media site for sale, and she said to the police, "This is it. You know, here you go." And they went, "We'll go and buy it back." Then. <laughs> I'm, wow, I'm that's uh, that's uh, that, that's crack squad policing isn't right it, there, yeah, isn't yeah. it? You can yeah. you can scroll online and see if your stolen objects are there and, and buy them back at a markup. Yeah. Um, I, I, whilst I've got you, I also want to bring up one other thing, which is uh, we're talking about police. We're talking about the state of the country and these these extraordinary 
bewildering, I think, protests that have been going on all these months. Uh, we, we should pause a moment to reflect that last week, this time last week, late on Friday night, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak mm. announced that he was going to speak to the country. And he did, and he came out onto the steps of a darkened number 10 Downing Street. Mm. And he gave this 10-minute address about our democracy being in peril, about the, the threats to our way of life and much more. And within 24 hours, it seems, everyone has forgotten about it. What was that about? What would you say of your experience in government? What was going on that made <sighs> this happen? It was a knee-jerk reaction to what had happened in the by-election the day before in Rochdale. Mm. Yeah. OK, so I don't want anybody to think that the words weren't needed to be said, because I agree with yeah, what Rishi Sunak said. Mm. Did he need to run out onto the streets of Downing Street and do it at 6.45 on a Friday evening? Oh, sorry, 5.45 That on is a Friday strange evening. timing, yeah, isn't six, it? Six, Just six in time in. for the 6 o'clock <laughs> news yes, headlines. Yeah, brilliant. And the amount of hairs that were set running in the media, uh, Tory MPs, the comments that were coming through, what's he going to say? People were coming to me and I was like, I, I don't know what he's going to say. That aside, I think that it was just that knee-jerk reaction. It was, we need to say something, I need to, to look as though I'm on top of this. Mm. When realistically, he could have just done that on Monday in the House of Commons as a statement. You didn't need to go and stand there. It was so the clearly a reaction to the Rochdale yeah, by election, which is disappointing. So you've seen the country go through this for months and you didn't yeah. feel a need to say this. You've seen uh, sort of anti Semitic slogans being, being chanted on the streets of London for months and you didn't feel the need to say Precisely. this. But when George Galloway wins a by election in, in Rochdale, that's when you're, you're so nervous. You're running scared. Exactly. And uh, the thing is, George, George Galloway, again, he's a crank. Um, but they didn't want to learn the lessons that should have been learned from that by-election. They just decided to say, oh, the crank's been elected, so we're really in trouble now. It's ludicrous. OK, and it was, you know, it's a democratically elected individual. Exactly. Whether you right. agree with him or not, the people of Rochdale have put him into the House of Commons. That should have been the end of it. And they didn't talk about anything else that he said outside no. of Gaza. They didn't talk about, no. you know, opening up uh, the, the maternity care and, and the emergency and the A&E and uh, sort of Rochdale Infirmary. Well, they didn't did did he run they on that a lot? Well, no, but he spoke about that. He spoke yeah. about bringing yeah. back uh, sort of uh, the association football, Rochdale Association Football Club. He spoke about um, law and order and bringing in more community policing. Yeah, but I mean, that wasn't but, uh, why he won is, the election. But the, the, so. point, the point is... Labour, who should have been running on that, have not said anything even remotely associated with things that affect local people. But they're, they're more incensed by something that's going on in the Middle East. Well, I, that's yeah. the frustration. Yeah. 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 No, do, you, it is. do you agree, though, uh, panel, with, the, uh, with Rishi's claim that uh, extremists are targeting democracy? Uh, I mean, I, no. I, I, I think it was a real headline grabbing mm. moment. And there is a problem with extremism within the United Kingdom. I don't think anybody can sit there and say that there isn't. But he didn't give any idea as to how to actually deal with it. The extremists are the people in Parliament, and the extremism is extreme complacency. That's yeah. the problem. That's the extremism. <laughs> the extreme uh, sort of yeah. apathy and complacency and luxury belief of, of the M25 elite bubble. That's, that's the extremism. Because it, you have to be an extremist to, to watch your country and in, in many ways aid it decline in this way. But if you're not going to do anything about it, if you're not going to give a, a bunch of solutions to it, then it is pretty pointless to stand there and say, yeah, you know, this is uh, well, a front to our democracy. It's like, OK, well, Prime Minister. Well, you're that, that, goes, what are you doing about? that goes to something I said earlier, which is I, I, it's, it all feels so dated. Everything he said sounded like the things that Blair said after the 2005 mm. suicide bombings in yeah. London. Yeah. It was all this sort of, we've got to stand up to the extremists so much more. But I don't see them actually doing that. I mean, there's two names I want to throw out for both of you before we go to the break. Um, the first is, is David Amos, Sir David Amos. When he was brutally murdered by a jihadi uh, a couple of years ago, uh, everybody uh, of his former colleagues uh, uh, stood up in uh, several hours in the House of Commons and they paid great tribute to a wonderful, lovely man, but none of them said what the ideology of his attacker was. Yeah, course, it yeah. was as if it was as if as if he died of natural causes. Of, of, of consumption. And yeah. and I am still amazed by this. I think they did him great dishonor, by the way. Um, because when Joe Cox was brutally murdered, mm -hmm. uh, uh, MPs quite rightly said we will you know find out the ideology of the person who did this and we'll tackle it. And they did, and we do as a society. I think we have absolutely no truck in Britain for the very occasional kind of neo-Nazi, you know, extremists like that. And they have no real presence on the streets, as far as I can see. And if they did, almost everyone in Britain would stand up to them. 
But when it's a jihadist uh, uh, murderer, maniac, right, the one who killed David Amos, all of David Amos's colleagues stand there in Parliament and they talk about things like the online harms bill. Yeah. It has nothing isn't, to do with it. Isn't it incredible that uh, Rishi Sunak, and, and MPs have welcomed this, he's greenlit £30 million in extra funding for added police protection for MPs, but they're not mm. willing to question the reason or the ideology which necessitates this need for heightened security. They're happy to take the extra security, they just don't want to question why it's necessary or what's behind it. It's the same thing. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I think it is really difficult to, to kind of balance that off with that speech. Mm. And if you're not going to call out who the extremists are, right. then what's the point? It reminds me of some years ago uh, uh, when there was, a, there was a rally against anti-Semitism in London. There was a, a prominent reform rabbi and she said uh, um, that, 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 that everyone should have the same slogan as the anti-fascists did in the 1930s, they shall not pass. And, uh, and I said afterwards, but who? Yes. Who? Now, there's one other name I want to throw out, which is the name, of course, of Suella Braverman. Mm. Because I was struck, one other thing on this with Rishi's speech last week, I was struck by something. Everything he said in this emergency late night statement on the steps of Downing Street, wasn't it just what Suella Braverman has said some months ago? With a bit more padding. And in that case, isn't the former Home Secretary, who was fired for her comments, isn't she just guilty of being correct but too early? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, I mean, it, this is the thing. So, Suella Braverman was, was basically Rishi Sunak's attack dog. She was supposed to say things that he couldn't say, but knew she, he knew needed to be said, because one, a lot of it is right, and two, it gives him some sort of conservative credentials. The problem with Suella Braverman is that she didn't have, I suppose, the political acumen to know when something should be said, how to say it, and all of that. But yeah. many people agreed with her. So she left Rishi no choice but to distance himself from her. From her. But now he's trying to say the same things basically that she was saying, but with a bit more tact. The yeah. problem is you can say what you want, but if you're not going to do anything and, about and it, that's my, stop and, it. And that is my whole point. I mean, I'm not a great fan of Suella Braverman. That yeah. comes to no surprise to anybody. But unless you are going to have something to back it up, then all you're doing is putting out some words. Yeah. Hot air. Right. And people will agree with them, people will disagree with them, and then they'll move on. Yep. But realistically, the problem is still there. Yeah. The problem is still left undealt with. We have had an awful lot of words in the last 20 <laughs> years on this problem. And, uh, yeah, I've run out of counting the number of times people have said, we're going we're gonna to deal with this. Uh, it's an urgent yeah. thing. And, uh, and, you, and the years pass That's and fine. the decades yeah. pass. Anyway, on that happy, cheery thought, coming up, Joe Biden lays out plans for Gaza in his State of the Union speech as a senior US official says, we are not waiting on the Israelis. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. US President Biden's annual speech took a far feistier tone than usual last night, demanding Israel increases the amount of aid entering Gaza. The US military will now establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast to increase the flow of humanitarian aid to the troubled territory. Yet, Biden insisted no U.S. boots will be on the ground. Joining me now is military and defence analyst Colonel Simon Diggins. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, now, no U.S. boots on the ground, President Biden says. What's your thoughts on this? I mean, he's going to have a problem with that, I think. I mean, he's talked about the, the building of the pier, which is what they're talking about, trying to bring aid in, uh, using, um, doing it as far as they can remotely from, from there. Um, I think the phrase boots on the ground often refers to, if you like, the issue of kind of mission creep uh, and the idea then perhaps of the US providing some kind of protective security around around that. Uh, and that's clearly something that they're not prepared to countenance from uh, from there and not without significant changes to the way in which the, the campaign has been conducted both by Hamas and by, by the Israelis. Um, but he will, I think, be able to deliver on the pier but actually what happens beyond that, I think, is, is really quite problematic. Walk me through the logistics of this, because yeah, if, you, if you create a new pier and you start to deliver humanitarian aid that way, presumably, um, whether they're uh, Palestinians, civilians who have nothing to do with uh, Hamas or Hamas or Hamas supporters, uh, there'll be a rush for the uh, aid that's coming in. And then yeah. surely whoever's delivering the aid needs to be protected. And surely if you have people protecting the people delivering the aid, uh, they've got to do something if, if things go south. Uh, I mean, isn't it inevitable that, that, that Biden is actually putting American troops not on the pier, but, yes, on the ground and potentially in harm's way? It's not inevitable. But you've laid out precisely the kind of challenge that they've got. I know from some of the descriptions that are coming through uh, that the plan at the moment is the aid will be uh, channelled through Cyprus, through Larnaca, uh, and that Israeli security will be allowed to, to monitor what appears on the aid in order to try and prevent stuff from going through. Uh, the Americans were very keen not to have troops there on the ground, but you've, you, you've absolutely laid out the, the, the dilemma. You'll recall very similar sort of issues occurring in Somalia uh, mm. in the early 1990s, where what started as a humanitarian mission uh, inevitably had a sort of creep factor att attached to it, not least of which because it suited some of the extremist groups there to try and draw the Americans in, and indeed they eventually were. So whether or not that is that is that happens, and, and Biden is, is actually reluctant to get involved in, in foreign wars. I mean, we always talk about Trump and his mm. unwillingness, but actually Biden was a man who opposed Obama's uh, in a surge into Afghanistan yeah. in uh, in 2010. So it's not it is not his natural, uh, if you like, tendency to try and increase that. But you have quite rightly identified uh, there is a danger that with this plan that American troops be drawn into directly into the conflict, even if it's just sort of as protecting the peer. In your experience, I mean, what other situations like this come to mind when you hear uh, a proposal like this from the U.S. president? 
Um, you, it, 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 there's nothing quite like this, given the sort of scale of what's going on. But the requirement to support civilians, and I think we should not be getting away from this, actually lies with the occupying power. And the real issue at the moment is the Israelis themselves are not allowing sufficient aid into the, into the area. They've got their reasons for so doing, uh, but the point about it is, is this international humanitarian law is absolutely clear on this. Um, if you're the occupying power, you have the responsibility of looking after the civilian population. And for lots of reasons, the Israelis have failed so to do. And that's the challenge that the rest of humanity and the rest of, the, if you like, the world view has got, that actually the Israelis who have that responsibility are not doing this, therefore somebody else has to. Uh, and that creates a political issue and a political problem which the Americans are now seeking to address. Of course, The, the Americans Israeli... are very clear because they're not now waiting for the Israelis. You know, we yeah. saw that with the airlift, uh, of of an airdropping of, of aid recently, and there's another airdrop I think and, uh, has, has taken place since since then, and they're doing this now with the peer that they can't do it through air. They're therefore going to try and go for a sea delivery. But the actual onus, the responsibility, international law lies with the Israelis, and they have failed so to do. Oh, well, two questions quickly. I mean, first of all, of course, the Israelis say that the much of the aid going in, if they don't check it, includes some of the weapons that have already gone in through particularly the Egypt crossing into Gaza. There have been a, a weaponry found in that in the past, including since the beginning of the war. Um, presumably, you say that the aid coming through Cyprus, that'll be checked and it would be uh, able to be... We, everyone would be able to be reassured that it wouldn't uh, contain anything uh, of that kind. That's the plan. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, we, we can't hide from the fact that people will try and use aid uh, to disguise it. The question is the scale. You know, the scale, if you like, of the diversion of, of aid to what you might call nefarious purposes, whether it be stuff that isn't actually aid but is weapons go, going through, uh, or that which is sort of diverted to Hamas and only to Hamas and not to, the, to, to them. I think all these things are a compromise. Uh, and I think well, there's always a kind of recognition in the same way that shops recognise the element of kind of not only shoplifting, but also, um, sadly, you know, stuff stolen from their own by their own staff occurs, but it doesn't stop them from delivering, having a shop. So similarly, I think the challenge for, for everyone is recognise that some of this may go astray, some of it will be misused versus the overwhelming imperative. I, I don't think, unfortunately, you can have an absolutely clear black and white this is, we, we can't have aid going through because there is a possibility of it either being diverted or, or, or weapons being smuggled in. I mean, that's a kind of an absolute security position. But given the circumstances in Gaza at the moment, I don't think that's an absolute, as an absolute position. Uh, it's sustainable. And um, one very quick final question. Uh, the world is all focused on Rafa now. And uh, Rafa is obviously the last headquarters of, the, of Hamas. In Gaza, uh, there's uh, an international aid situation there as well. Uh, you say the Israelis are the uh, occupying power in the Gaza, but who's the occupying power in uh, Rafa? Well, whatever's left of the, the Hamas civil administration. I mean, they, they, they do have some continuation. I think one of the challenges that has occurred is that there's been kind of that, that, that Hamas, because they've controlled that, and we've had the issue over what are the numbers of casualties that have taken place uh, throughout this particular conflict. Uh, but there, there, is, there are remnants of the civil administration that, that exists, mm -hmm. including, for example, the police force. Elements of them, of course, are compromised. But again, I get to the point now where you know, I don't think we're in a world where we can be absolutist about this. You know, mm -hmm. we, the, an element of the Palestinian authorities, not necessarily the Palestinian Authority, which sits in the West Bank, but elements of the Palestinian authorities will have to be dealt with, will have to be united. Not least of which, because the alternative, which was the United Nations organisation, uh, has been seen, has been accused of being compromised, uh, and money is not going through there as well. Uh, so we, we are in a, in a very in a, in a dilemma of what do, what do we do. I mean, there are examples. You asked the question of what happens in the past. There are examples, and I'll give you an example from the Second World War, where in the, in the winter of 44, 45, there was, through the Red Cross, a negotiation with the German authorities to continue to occupy most of the Netherlands to allow food aid into the Netherlands, and, and airdrops took place into that area. So even in the middle of the most war, you know, awful wars, humanitarian considerations, recognising it's a compromise, recognising it's not perfect, will take place in order to achieve a better humanitarian end. And I think, I think that's where we are now. Uh, with, with this. It's not perfect, Douglas. It's not clear-cut. Wow. I absolutely accept all of those points. Uh, but I think that's where, where we've got to with, with, the, with the situation in Gaza.
Thank you very much, Colonel Simon Diggins. Now, still with me here in the studio are Claire and Esther. I wanted to pivot to one other story that's come up uh, as a result of the State of the Union address uh, of President Biden's. Um, Sweden has become the 32nd member of NATO uh, upon its accession. Uh, in Biden's speech uh, last night, he talked a lot about the threats, not just at home that he saw to democracy, but the threats abroad. And principally, he focused on the issue of Vladimir Putin. Uh, this is a pretty amazing thing, though, isn't it? Because Vladimir Putin's uh, justification, one of his justifications for the illegal invasion of Ukraine was that uh, everyone was, was that Russia was being encircled by NATO. Yeah. And if, if, if his main uh, aim was to stop Russia being encircled by NATO, by invading Ukraine, he has just pushed two more countries into NATO, Finland and now Sweden. Yeah, he's NATO's best salesman. Yeah, and it's quite interesting with Sweden, who have spent, well, you know, what, several hundred years uh, mm -hmm. being really neutral mm. in in the mm. in this kind of area, and they have always kept out of these kind of arguments and uh, not wished to join NATO mm. previously. And really, really interesting that now they can see the benefit of being within NATO, they can see the threat mm. from Putin, and they are willing to join forces. They're willing to break that kind of neutrality silence that they've always had. I mean, it's, what, 1,300 kilometres of border yeah. that Finland and Sweden have with Russia. It's huge. It is enormous, mm. and it's now going to be NATO territory. So, I mean, it's a real big, clear message out there to, to Putin that people aren't going to put up with those kind of bullying tactics, but I don't think he's going to back down. I don't think that he is mm. going to take this in any way seriously. Seriously, I don't think he. I don't think he bargained that the the the, uh, the West would allow this conflict to to carry on mm. for as long as he did. Yeah, I think he estimated, and of course I'm not in his head, that within two years the the West will sue for some sort of peace because, of course, mm -hmm. this is unsustainable. Uh, I, my question is more kind of on the logistics. Will now Sweden? and Finland be pressured to meet the NATO obligations like other NATO members ah. are pressured oh, and don't meet the NATO obligations. So yeah. I actually found that uh, other than the US, only the UK and the Greeks um, mm -hmm. meet their, their 2% GDP right. target. And the Greeks only meet that because they use it to bribe military officials. <laughs> um, so it's not because they're actually uh, keeping uh, their uh, We have to say at that point, we have to say allegedly. Allegedly, and, yes. and, allegedly. And, and, and also really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but this is the point, and Trump was making that point, and he's absolutely oh, he's right. You don't say. get to be part of the club yeah. and, and, and beg for American protection phase. when you're yeah. not meeting your obligations. It's supposed and to be it, mutual. And it's quite interesting that people pull... President Trump apart for saying it. Oh, you yeah. mustn't say things like that, but why not? If you're a member of a club, you have to abide by the rules and you have to pay into it. And I think he was only highlighting that. And I don't agree with him on many things, but I do fundamentally. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. about meet our own obligations, really. Yeah. It is, a, it is a remarkable one that all that Trump said was what yes. every previous yeah. US president has said yeah. in the years of NATO, which is if you're going to be a member of the club, pay up. Yeah. Anyhow, coming up. I'll be speaking to one woman who thinks International Women's Day is a big waste of time. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right yay. too. Quite yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Today, Friday the 8th of March, marks, as I'm sure you know, International Women's Day. For over a decade, women and girls use this day to simply celebrate their gender. But not all women think it's a great idea. Joining me now is a YouTuber and anti-feminist influencer, Pearl Davis. Thanks very much for being with us, Pearl. Uh, um, I obviously don't have a right to talk about this subject at all, but uh, uh, Why you not? do. What? Well, men aren't allowed to talk about women. We all know that. Why? Because we can establish what famous you, it's rule. It's a safe space fa here. Fa famous rule in the modern era. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, what, what do you mm -hmm. make of all this? Are you celebrating I, a, a, International Women's Day in a big way? I think that we should focus on accomplishment rather than just being a woman. I don't see the need to have an International Woman's Day by virtue of just being a woman. Why don't we focus on something that we have accomplished? You know, 50% of the population is born a woman. You didn't do anything to become competent at something or become great at something. It's just, you know, celebrating being a woman for being a woman. And what have we really accomplished? We don't do the majority of hard jobs in society. One out of three of us has had an abortion. One out of four of us has an STD. 90% of us have been on birth control. You know, the birth rate is falling because of women's choices. You know, at the end of the day, why don't we talk about accomplishment rather than just focus on being a woman for being a woman? It's the same thing as a participation trophy. Okay, but I, I just don't see the point. I, I, I follow you on part of that, but uh, what, what's abortions and STDs got to do with it? Oh, women's poor choices. I mean, honestly, we've had more choice in the last hundred years than ever, and we just choose poorly. Um, for example, abortion, that's one example. STDs is another example. The birth rate is falling. Um, we, have, we own 80% of the world's debt. 80%? We're a net tax loss. We're the majority on benefits. So, you know, and the point of that is, is that, you know, by giving us participation trophies and saying that we've accomplished something that we haven't, um, it, in my opinion, all it does is enable us to make poor choices with no repercussions. Oh, well, some people say that, uh, and again, I can't possibly give my own opinion on this, but some people say... You can. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm teasing you. Um, uh, uh, some people say that uh, what this day does bring is an opportunity to pay attention and celebrate, uh, uh, as you say, 50% of the population who have historically uh, not had access to some of the same opportunities that men have, haven't had... Uh, what opportunities? The, the educational opportunities. I'm thinking of things like university. Many universities didn't admit women until I mean, the women have been faring years. better than men in school for quite some time. You know, the first female property owner was in the 1600s. You know, a lot of times what feminists do is they rewrite history and make it seem like we were much more oppressed than we were. Women have historically been a protected class and have had more rights than the average man. You know, for example, women were never required to go to war. 
You know, th that was something that men were required to do. Oftentimes women were actually a protected class. Uh, you know, so, and the only reason I'm cutting you off is because, you know, the more we repeat this stuff, the more we think it's true. It's just not true. The uh, first female millionaire, 1800s, you know, women, you know, even in ancient Egypt, you know, there were examples of female pharaohs. Esther, I see you nodding furiously uh, as I Pearl is speaking. Uh -huh, yes. Uh, I am curious, though, um, where your stats on the STDs uh, and abortions are coming from. I'm assuming it's the US. CDC. Yeah, CDC. OK, oh, OK, I just wanted to clarify that. Look, my issue with International Women's Day is that it's been hijacked by, I, I initially said Western feminists, uh, but I'm now going to broaden that and say just Western women in general, because they, mm. they usually address issues that are clearly almost unique to Western women and their experiences. So for instance, you have Western feminists that are, are more concerned with freeing the nipple or, or whinging that a man is opening the door for them or talking about the gender pay gap or having a child and having a family is not, mm. is not a blessing that you should... You should I, try, I, have a, I have a policy. I try to get around that one of the misogyny of opening a door for a woman. Well, if, I see a, <laughs> if I see a woman trying to open a door, I push it from the other side just well, so I can uh, show, <laughs> show that we're exactly. equal. Show that you're in power. But then yeah. you have the other end of the extreme end, which I suspect... Um, uh, Pearl occupies, which is, you know, uh, women have had it so good and all of that and, and effectively ignoring clear systemic injustices that women have had to face. I mean, I'm I'm someone okay, I, which I, I grew up. Well, I'll give you an example. I grew up in, in, in Ghana in West Africa and I, I, I happened. I was fortunate enough to have grown up in an educated family that saw the value of educating me and my brother equally. But I also had a classmate that was married off at 18 and had four kids by 24 and had basically no say in it. And this is in a modern uh, country, in a modern well, it sounds, uh, world. It sounds so, like you guys had choice. Because well, no, you because, chose one because thing hold and on, she chose someone, another. someone born, someone of my same socioeconomic standing didn't have that choice. And I think you're talking but, but, about it as if that the problem doesn't exist. Why the, didn't the she have the choice? If you had the choice. How did she you have the choice? Were you paying her school fees? Were you going to offer? Well, why should you be entitled to free things? That's just what do you a mean be entitled thing? to free things? Why shouldn't you have the choice of who you marry or if you want to marry? Isn't that? Isn't you that had a, the choice, but you guys are from the same country. You had the you had the choice. The, the I'm saying she you just gave an choice. example of you having well, a let, choice. I, I can tell you this. If you grew up in northern Nigeria, you might have I'm very just saying, well been your story, your story, Your story contradicts itself. That's it my point. It doesn't contradict itself. Because you claimed, are, you claimed that there was no choice and you had a choice. Claimed. She Claire. didn't have a choice. Did you hear what I said? The girl didn't have a choice. Because she was well, just why? a girl. Why? Uh, By virtue of being a girl. She was 18. She was 18, was she not? OK, I want to bring in Claire. Claire, do you agree with Pearl? No, I'm afraid not. And, you know, as we've seen on International Women's Day, I have had a message on social media that says that I'm only spouting what my husband has allowed me to spout. And here we are in 2024. So, no, we need to fight for the rights of women. And I think it makes so? it even more it's impressive on International sexist. Women's Day that the misogyny is still alive and kicking. Women didn't have the vote in the United Kingdom until 100 or yeah, so years why? ago. Yeah, but why? 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 Because they were not considered they not to be clever vote? enough. They were not considered a, to no, be landowners. No, that's not you, have you, have you no, absolutely it's so funny. You guys, come on Please TV. Have you that. read the writings? Have you read the writings the of the writings. early suffragettes from the 1920s? Is that, is that the form, is that the form, right? No. Hang on, one at a time. Hang on. You have it. That's the funny thing. And it's because, again, you know, freedom came with responsibility. Freedom came with the responsibility where you had to be enlisted in the draft. That is why women did not get the vote. Most people in history did not get to vote. To this was US. not simply a man yeah. or a woman thing. It was, it was we do well, not get the freedom okay. without the, the UK, responsibility it was more to do that with comes property with ownership, yeah. But, yeah. And, and, and here in the United Kingdom, it was to do with owning property. It was Women were not considered to be uh, relevant on their own. They had to take their husband's status and they weren't allowed into the House of Commons for some considerable period of time. And if you're 50% of the population, why should you not no. represent them? So, no, I think we need to keep on fighting the fight for women but, on International Women's Day. I don't like the marketing but again, aspect the property, of it. Property ownership came with the responsibility of owning property. And, and that, that's the thing. Freedom always came with responsibility. And we go on these shows and we spout out stuff like, you guys clearly haven't read this stuff. Well, the it's writings, so obvious. The, writings, so, the, the little okay. writings of the Magna Yeah, yeah, the, writing, the writings of the suffragettes and the anti-suffragettes at the time, because you really don't understand what went on at the okay. time until you've actually what, read from right. the people at the time. Let me, let me just uh, quickly, before I let you go, uh, Pearl, I mean, I, I hear the, the, the criticisms of, of International Women's Day and things, but if, if, I, if I can actually, 
as, as they say, speaking as a man. Um, if I can say, the thing that, um, that, that I do think is, is a criticism of this is that we do tend to, and it goes slightly to what Esther said, uh, is that there's a lot of focus on uh, high-end professions and, like, membership of boards, for instance. Uh, uh, there's a stat I have here that was being given out by the WEF that women only make up 37.8% of boards. Uh, is, isn't there a risk, though, with all this, that actually what something like International Women's Day does is it focuses on, like, high-status professions and it ignores... Uh, the kinds of young women and girls Esther referred to. I mean, what I mean is ordinary people. And that there's this focus on the, the strangest, highest-end professions and just an ignoring of some real needs of some real people. Sorry, what's the, what's the question? Do you agree that, there's, that International Women's Day ends up focusing on, arguably, these high-end problems? instead of some of the actual problems that do exist for some girls around the world, particularly in the developing world? Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from the West because I'm in the West. I can't really speak to countries that I'm not, yeah. I'm not from, right, or I don't live in. But, yeah, I mean, in all honesty, what percent of people are going to be the board of anything? What, what percent of people are going to be CEOs? It just doesn't speak to the average existence of a man and a woman in this country. And the truth of the matter is women do not do the hardest jobs in society. You know, I can quote A World Without Men by Aaron Clary. They, they have an actuary verify these statistics. Women do not do the hard jobs in society. Men do the majority of infrastructure jobs. Well, that's certainly true. Uh, Pearl, thank you very much for being with us. Um, Still with me in the studio is Claire Pearsall and Esther Cranko. Um, uh, uh, apparently, women don't do the difficult no. job. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah. Right, OK, so raising children. I might not go out there and build bridges and lift heavy things, which is apparently what I'm supposed to be doing now. Um, bringing up children. I mm. did that for nine years as a single parent whilst going out to work. It mm. was really difficult. Mm. I don't blame anybody, other than my ex-husband, for that. <laughs> but... You get on and you do it, and women are perfectly able to. And I thought she was very dismissive. Pearl was very dismissive of what you were saying. Well, about I, think, I, I think maybe she the, didn't understand the eighteen-year-old that you um, knew, which I, just, I, I think uh, is very, very difficult. May, uh, maybe it's 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 she didn't understand the context. I don't know, but I think this fixation on who does a harder job or mm. who has the nicer job, or mm. you know, women should be CEOs, but no one's complaining that women are not bricklayers or, or sewage yes. cleaners, <laughs> or, or that you know, the, this this fixation on who has it worse. It's it's irrelevant and it's 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 deep. It's very unimportant because in the grand scheme of things, you should be talking about things that affect human beings. We should be just as incensed about male suicide rates and the fact that white working class boys are at the bottom yeah. of scholastic attainment in this country, as we should about, you know, girls being kidnapped by Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I and don't, that, that, I don't this, disagree these sorts of the, uh, the sort of shock jocks, they, they completely skew the debates because they don't focus on consequential things. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things I would say on this. I mean, one is I, I hate the zero-sum game of it, you know, mm -hmm. that in order for uh, women to succeed, men have to be told to shut up a exactly. bit yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, really, I'm mean, like... Famous phrase, everyone's got to get along. And I do worry that some of this, it just actually drives everybody apart. And women and men have, uh, should have equal opportunities simply because everybody in society should, because everybody should be able to flourish. Anyway, coming up, the UK's counter-extremism czar said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following fortnightly pro-Palestinian protests. And meanwhile, a school in Devon has been criticised for removing house names dedicated to the likes of Sir Walter Raleigh because they are apparently controversial. That's our past. All controversial. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're watching and listening to Talk TV. Coming up, the UK's counter-extremism czar has said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. President Biden warns that freedom and democracy are under attack at home and overseas in his State of the Union address. His speech comes as the US is to build a temporary Gaza port to increase the flow of aid. And why a school in Devon has been criticised for removing house names dedicated to the likes of Sir Walter Raleigh because of their so-called controversial past. All that and more. But first, let's get the news headlines. Good afternoon. The former Prime Minister Theresa May is to stand down at the next election after 27 years in her Maidenhead constituency. Best known for negotiating Brexit, she is one of 64 MPs elected as Conservatives set to quit Parliament. She says she wants to focus on other causes and it's been a difficult decision to make. She says she wants to focus on other causes um, and political editor at Tortoise Media, Kat Nealon, told Talk TV many MPs are likely to follow Theresa May's lead. I think a lot of uh, ministers, current and former, who are seriously questioning whether they stand now, it's not just about whether they lose their particular seat, but there is, you know, this recognition that they will be in opposition for at least five years, mm. perhaps ten. Uh, and having held a you know, a great office of state, the, the greatest office of state. Um, do you really want to be in that position where it's it's so lacking in power? The firearms officer charged with murdering Chris Cabber has been named. Metropolitan policeman Martin Blake is facing a trial over the fatal shooting of the 24-year-old in South London in 2022. Blake appeared in the dock at the Old Bailey today to plead not guilty. His trial begins in October. The Ministry of Defence is accused of not having a credible funding plan for the military equipment it needs. The Public Accounts Committee says it puts the country in an alarming place and reliant on allies for protection. 
It found a £17 billion financial black hole and says the MOD is putting off painful decisions to deal with it. Former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth told Talk Today that the government needs to stop operating in the past. We have moved on from the Cold War. I mean, my generation dominated by the Cold War and defence procurement was basically um, really seeing the meeting the Russians, getting ahead of them, and each side matching the other. Today, we're in a war in Europe. And what um, the, uh, the, the current government has recognised is that we need a whole new procurement model. Joe Biden's confirmed plans to build a temporary port on Gaza's coast, but insisted there'll be no American boots on the ground. He says it will help get larger ships into the region to deliver more humanitarian aid. During his final State of the Union address before November's election, he also warned freedom and democracy are under attack. Bob Mulholland is a long-term friend of Biden. He told Talk Today that it was a political speech and a clever one. I thought the president uh, was smart in the way he contrasted himself with Trump. Never, I don't think he ever mentioned the name Trump. He just said his predecessor. And I think most American people, the reason they threw uh, Trump out of office in 2020, despite what Trump says, is they're just tired of the chaos. Here in the UK, the government's commissioner for countering extremism, Robin Simcox, has warned that London has become a no-go zone for Jews every weekend. He said that last October's Hamas attacks on Israel will come to define our era and that ministers must be bolder and move faster in tackling all forms of extremism. And Adam Sandler was the highest earning actor of 2023 thanks to a Netflix deal. He earned $73 million on the back of producing several films, which he also starred in, beating Barbie actor Margot Robbie, who made $59 million. Others in the top ten include Tom Cruise, Ryan Gosling and Jason Stratton. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, many of us will be seeing some dry conditions to end the week, but it is pretty chilly. And we've got uh, an area of sunshine down towards the south over western parts of Scotland too. But uh, the rain isn't too far away. That's going to be making its way in tonight. So through the rest of the afternoon, then clearer skies down towards the south, western parts of the UK mainland and western parts of Scotland. Always cloudier along these northeastern coasts. And here we could see some patchy rain and drizzle. Not particularly warm, temperatures in single figures for most. And to go with that, we've got this strong easterly wind. Now, even though it's coming from the east, it'll be strongest in the west over parts of Wales and the southwest and indeed through the channel where there's a bit of a squeeze. As we go into this evening and overnight, the cloud thickens up down towards the south and that's going to bring in areas of showery rain. So temperatures lifting there before the dawn, but still like to see a touch of frost in these northern areas. And still with that keen breeze, it is going to feel very cold indeed. So Saturday, not quite such a good day. We've got these areas of uh, showery rain pushing their way northwards. Clearer skies for a time through central and eastern parts. And this is where we'll see the highest temperatures around 11 or 12 degrees Celsius. That's 54 Fahrenheit. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon and welcome back. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. Today, we're asking about the UK's counter-extremism czar's comments where he said that London has become a no-go area for Jews following pro-Palestinian protests. I want to know what your reaction is. Is he right? You can get involved in that discussion by texting on 8722, that's 8722, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV, that's at Talk TV. Joining me now to run through all the top stories is former government advisor Claire Pearsall and political commentator Esther Kraku. Uh, let me come uh, straight to both of you. We've got some texts, tweets, mm. Xs and comments. What have we got, Esther? So William here says, we will end up with segregated towns and cities, but I guess that's the plan to divide and conquer. Uh, Alex says, reminds me of how Germany used to be back in the 30s and 40s. History is supposed to teach us to prevent such events from being repeated. 
And uh, Marie says, we now live in a country where British citizens are unable to walk freely in certain areas. Can anyone give me something positive about this or do we need to eradicate the issue? And Sammy, I am ashamed of what is happening now. The hatred of Jews has never gone away. Gosh, thank you. Well, I'm joined now uh, by the founder and executive director of the Henry Jackson Society, Dr. Alan Mendoza. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, what do you make of the uh, comments that have been splashed all across the front page of The Telegraph and other newspapers this morning? Well, um, you know, Robin Simcox is right, isn't he? I mean, he's pointed out to an obvious problem, which is that every Saturday, uh, the streets of the centre of our capital become no-go zones for British Jews, who are rightly worried about wandering uh, into an area where they should have every right to be in as anyone else in this country, and to be faced by people carrying uh, slogans that are sometimes anti-Semitic, sometimes have genocidal intent on them, and just a generally very hostile atmosphere. I think it's a fair comment, and he's right about it. Um, the, the polls at the beginning of these protests showed the British public believing, whether they agreed with the protests or not, that, you know, in Britain, people have the right to protest and so on. Do you think that people's attitudes have changed as the weeks and, indeed, months have gone on? Because these protests, among other things, I mean, it, you know, they, they, as well as being very offensive and intimidating to large sections of this country, uh, uh, they also close businesses and much more. Do you think that public sentiment is turning against these protesters? I think in one sense, um, I'd like to see some polling, firstly, uh, to, be, to that question to be asked, so that people understand what's happening right now. But I think the, the more interesting bit is that I think for most people, if they're not in the centre of London or having some purpose, they've kind of just, you know, sort of blocked it out. It's become yeah. part of the general noise. I think that's what James Cleverly essentially was saying when he told the protesters uh, last week, you've made your point. Everyone knows what you're doing and nobody particularly cares anymore about it. Uh, but you're right, there is disruption to shops. If you want to go shopping in central London, it's become, you know, sort of a, a race to get through hundreds of thousands of people sometimes who are trying to stop you from doing your shopping. And Douglas, I think, you know, we have to look at concepts of liberty here, don't we? We talk about freedoms. Yes, of course, there's a freedom to protest and nobody wants to see that curtail. But there's also a freedom from having your lives disrupted week in, week out. And I don't think the freedom to protest means that any time you want to do something, it should be uh, given precedence over the freedoms of others to enjoy their time. To go back to the uh, Robin Simcox comments, um, I know of synagogues who've had to, uh, you know, not have services at their usual time simply because they're worried about what might happen if their members walk out into a mass march. Now, that's not freedom, is it? No, that, that, that's astonishing. I mean, you can only imagine the uh, uh, noise and the protests that would occur in this country if anything similar happened in regards to Muslim worshippers having to uh, change their orders of service or their times of service or feeling under such threat. But tell me, uh, Dr Mendoza, uh, last Friday, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak gave this speech uh, uh, on the steps of Downing Street. We were talking about it in the last hour. Uh, uh, and it's a sort of emergency statement, rather, rather surprising uh, circumstances, rather surprised he gave it. And uh, he talked about uh, what you've just mentioned, uh, the, the problems that the protests have brought, that the message has effectively uh, uh, hit home, uh, but, you know, uh, effectively called on Britain to be more resilient towards extremism. And immediately after he gave that speech, uh, the various groups that organise these weekly protests announced that they were going to do another one the next day, and they did. Uh, are these people just laughing at the Prime Minister? Well, I'm afraid they, they somewhat are. And I think that the core message of the uh, of that speech was, was great. You know, the, we've got to stand up against this, be resilient, stop our streets from being taken over. But, you know, he pointed out essentially to the police having to do their bit here. And I think part of the problem is that the protesters are laughing at the police as much as uh, the Prime Minister and the rest of us, mm. because they know that the police are somewhat cowed by their presence. And for whatever reason, the police are not willing to enforce our existing legislation that could quite easily control some of the wilder excesses at these marches, because there's just a reluctance that seems to do so. So I think the protesters are uh, laughing at everyone here in this country, saying, look how weak you all are. Even when you say you're going to get tough, you're not going to get tough. Well, let me bring you to an example of that. Uh, you mentioned the existing laws that the police are not using. The Prime Minister talked about new laws uh, that he might bring in. 
Um, uh, uh, what new laws are needed? I mean, um, we were talking also in the last hour about the, the burglary rates in this country. Half of burglaries in the UK don't 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 even get anywhere near being solved. And, and uh, as far as I know, burglary is already against the law. Um, and nothing happens about that. So, so I mean, what's the point of new laws, and what would they even be? Well, well, that's it, isn't it? If you don't enforce the law, it doesn't matter how many laws you have. You can have laws um, as long as your arm, and yet it won't make any difference. I think what people are desperately wanting now is to see both the existing laws enforced to the full, to the full, in the way that we would have recognised, you know, 10, 20 years ago, would have been the norm uh, if protests continued in the way that, that they have been doing so. And if, and if, for whatever reason, there is a legal problem with the current laws, then, to, you know, sort of with the minimal amount of fuss, insert new laws that then also get enforced. But it's the enforcement factor that matters more than just saying a new law is coming and uh, being processed. Without the enforcement, there is no purpose in having this discussion at all. And, and one final thing whilst I've got you. Um, I, I'm just very struck by the fact that uh, what you mentioned earlier about uh, synagogue services having to move. Uh, I've heard from many uh, Jewish friends and others that uh, the genuine fear that people have and the, the, the just months of people who are Jewish in this country, for instance, not being willing to go into the centre of London with their families. D do you think that in some way uh, um, this has been too quiet, this uh, concern? In that I'm just trying to think if any other group of people uh, in this country felt a fear of going into the centre of London on an average shopping day, I think there would be uproar. I think that if uh, there were marches in the centre of town by some kind of racist organisation that wanted to kill all black people, for instance, people would be talking about it. We wouldn't have had to have waited months for a front page headline like this. No, Douglas, you're, you're absolutely right. It's yet another example of what David Badil wrote in his book, that Jews seemingly don't count. That's essentially what it is. But the problem with that is, as, as you well know, is that if you start saying, oh, certain sections of the population are less important than others and we're not going to listen to them, it isn't long before the protesters move on to their next target. Yes, OK, the Jews might be today's target, but tomorrow it's other people who might oppose other views that they have uh, in common. And then we soon discover as a society that the danger of ignoring one problem when a no-go zone has been established is that it's much, much harder mm. to uh, bring people out uh, to oppose the no-go uh, zonization, as it were, for other people as well. So we should be much more attuned to the realities of what's been going on in London for the past few months. We should have been on top of it from day one. We've left it very late, but it isn't too late. That's the whole point. At any given moment, we could have the apparatus of law and order swing back in action and finally show that this is not a protesters free for all and that yes, there's a right to protest, but you can't do it if you're going to intimidate others. That's Alan Mendoza from the Henry Jackson Society. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I've still got my panel with uh, Claire Pearsall and Esther Krakow. Can I ask, uh, what, what do you make of that, and particularly that last point I made there? Do you think, I mean, I'm amazed at hearing uh, Dr Mendoza mentioning that about synagogue services changing, yeah. people being afraid to attend places of worship? I and, mean, that, and that's frightening, and uh, I, I think Alan, he's brilliant and he puts things very, very clearly. And I think he's right, is that who is the next target? If you don't get it right on this instance, mm. do they move on to another part of the community? And that shouldn't be allowed to happen. But I find it's appalling if synagogues can't hold a service. Amazing. I mean, do you imagine going into a, a country village and, for example, um, a church? Right. And if they were protesting outside a church saying, you mustn't have this on a Sunday morning, can you imagine the uproar in the little imagine village? Imagine, yeah. imagine the precedent this sets. Absolutely, and, yeah. and, and that's my point. And the wider societal implications, because if you allow effectively for, for Jewish people to be fair game, yeah. Right, then you can allow other groups to be fair game. You could, you yeah. could, you know, if you want to go and, and protest against, I don't know, Hindu temples in, in Leicester, you, you, you yep. theoretically could get away with it because if, mm -hmm. if they're not doing anything now, what other group would be would be targeted? Yeah. And, and and by the way, and, and some of the people, some of the loud mouths who've been in these protests have been up north. Uh, in Hindu areas, yes. trying mm. to stir up trouble with British Hindus as well. What is that? But this thing is, 
Yeah. When, we, when, we, when we saw the, uh, the inter sort of the sectarian violence break out, I think, amongst the Ethiopian groups in South London in December, mm. we were saying, well, this is Britain. This doesn't happen here. You don't import your problems uh, onto British shores and expect us to tolerate the sort of behavior. And, and now that, that's... And we, but the thing is, that, that didn't proliferate as much as these stories have because, obviously, it was a one-off thing. But actually, this could theoretically spread as well in the same and way. That's, and that's it. And, and who is next? Exactly. Mm. Who is going to say something that a group of people doesn't like you know, what about what about sort of football games on a Sunday? Yeah. Are we suddenly going to go, oh, we don't like football? Um, and I think we don't an, like the chanting. We don't, whatever it is, it, I mean, it can it can be something and nothing that is going to cause the next. Well, there was there was protests. one that was one that was on on that that was raised when the World Cup uh, took place in <laughs> Qatar, Qatar. Oh, yeah. and you'll remember that the uh, uh, Qatari authorities asked. Uh, um, England fans not to come in what uh, <coughs> is sometimes known as traditional English kit, which in, ah! the, mi in the Middle East is uh, is often seen as a crusader outfit. Yes. Uh, I thought that, I thought that was a um, pretty wonderful story, uh, um, uh, a meeting of uh, or a mismatch of cultures, exactly. shall we say? But Esther, you were saying. I was saying, you know, this this is actually an existential problem as I see it, mm. because it goes against the heart of what it means to be British. If we cannot have dialogue, if we cannot have a respectful conversation about things, yes, you can disagree. Mm -hmm. But if we cannot, at the very least, have conversation without people fearing for their lives, mm. I mean, this, this ceases to be Britain. That's right, and I think the, the ability to have a differing point of view, the ability to yeah. have a debate about something, it is being lost. You yeah. cannot have that. At the moment, you've got sides who are entrenched in their position and they're not going to move, and it doesn't matter what it is. You can have a discussion about, are oh, cats better than dogs, yeah. and you are immediately going to you this... can't call for the debate. death of cat owners. But this is, but this this is, this is how ridiculous it's become. You cannot have a debate anymore without one person saying, my point is right, you are wrong, you're offensive, and we're going to sort of rise up against you. Why has it become like this? Britain has always been very, very good at having discussions about yeah. absolutely everything and now we just seem to have these polarizing sides never the twain shall meet and i think that is and we are more the poorer for it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah i couldn't agree more um one other story we should we should come to which is the uh, u.s uh, has said well president joe biden said in his state of the union address last night uh, that america is going to increase food aid to gaza by among other things building a port uh, to bring the aid into. This, uh, this is an extraordinary story because, of course, uh, the US president, like his predecessor, uh, has been insistent that US boots won't go on the ground anywhere. And uh, although it seems that they might not be exactly on the ground uh, in Gaza, uh, US boots will certainly be in the port and very near the ground. Mm. Esther, do you see this as an important escalation of American involvement in the Middle East? Well, it's, it's completely impractical. I think it was Colonel uh, Simon Diggins who said, this is not sustainable. And I think that's, that's, the, mm. that's the sort of key word to take, take away from that, not sustainable. Uh, there are obviously practical implications of if you have these, this, this port, someone needs to manage it, those mm. people need to be protected. Are they willing to pull the trigger if their lives are in, are in danger? And again, who will they be pulling the trigger against, which mm. could then escalate into a regional crisis? Um, so it's it's impractical. Obviously, it's, it's uh, ideologically incoherent. Biden is effectively undermining uh, his, his support for one of his allies by doing this, um, even though the, the Israelis are letting it go ahead. Um, but I think what most what concerns most people is what next? I think that's that's yeah. the biggest question because both sides are losing so much. I mean, you know, I, I was reading a statistic that uh, 200,000 um, Palestinians that work in Israel uh, from, from mm. the Gaza Strip are, are, can no longer work in Israel. Uh, yeah. And that's affecting farming in, in the region. That's affecting the Israeli economy. That's affecting, you know, this, this conflict is affecting the, the tech industry in, in, in Israel because so many of the people that work in tech are, are reservists that are now fighting in Gaza. This cannot, this cannot be allowed to go on. I mean, if he's doing this, if he's building this port, what most people are thinking is, oh, my God, do you, do you expect this to go on for more months? Well, that's it. How temporary is temporary? Yeah. Mm. Because it's quite a structure to, to go and put up in the first place. It is quite exactly. something to say to Israel, we are just going to ignore you and uh, we are going to do this. Because one of your allies is sort of saying, no, you know, can we just calm this down? We need to come up with a solution. And America is just sort of rowing in and doing as it pleases. And I, I find that really difficult to, to understand how... Biden thinks that he can get away with it. I have to say, uh, it, it's, it's extraordinary as, a, as an example of mission creep. 
Uh, I yeah. mean, th you know, mm. that, that's the thing that the military and politicians are always most in fear right. of, is mission creep. The number of times that you send in a small force somewhere and before you know it, you're dragged in. Almost every conflict is like a kind of quick, quicksand. Yeah. It's extremely hard to get out of once you start, whatever the validity of it when you've started. Uh, well, I wanted to pick up one thing you said, Esther. You referred to the workers uh, from the Gaza Strip. That's a very, very important and underreported on story. Mm. Just before October the 7th, uh, there was meant to be another increase of yeah. Gazan workers, Palestinian workers working inside Israel and getting the permits to do so. And I have to say, one of the most tragic uh, second order stories of this whole thing is the fact that uh, it's been discovered, and I've seen it myself on the ground, that a lot of the people who were killed in the communities around Gaza, uh, the information that the terrorists of the 7th had to tell them exactly which houses to go through go to from these workers were yeah. based on information from workers from Gaza so it's uh, it's a second order of a uh, priority perhaps but yeah I mean I see no likelihood of Gazan workers being back inside Israel well, yeah. anytime soon mm -hmm. because nobody trusts them anymore and um, and arguably with with, with some right um, just just very quickly and finally on on this uh, with the Gaza story. Of course, everything in American politics is not... Everything that is domestic is international, and everything that's international is domestic, yeah. and everything always comes back to former President Trump, who will be talking a bit uh, about a bit in the next segment. But uh, is, is this all some kind of manoeuvre to do with the elections in, uh, in November? Is, is, is Biden looking forward to that, trying to show his foreign policy credentials, or is this all just a cynical thing about the Democrat base that is is uh, increasingly worried about the Democrat president being such a strong ally of Israel. I mean, you can never ignore the fact that, of course, these politicians have their eye out on the election mm -hmm. and how, how their foreign policy uh, or their, 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 their image looks um, to the outside world. So, of course, that, that, is, that is the case. But I, I suspect he's hoping for something a bit more permanent. So I, in, in Biden's dream world, I suspect he would think, you know, Ukraine is wrapped up. He'll, he'll have a deal wrapped up before uh, Trump can say, I'm going to get them in the room and I'm going to sort this out. Um, and I think it's the same thing with, with sort of Israel-Gaza. Uh, I think he's hoping that he would have at least the pause in fighting long enough for him to squeak by in the election, if, if that's yeah. even possible. Um, I and, and, I do, and I do think you're right, that one eye on the election, mm. because what we know from politicians is always there's a half an eye looking at what is their legacy? Mm. Ah. What is their give to the world? And it doesn't surprise me that Biden is looking to be the peacekeeper of uh, the Middle East. Now, that's a tall ask, and I think he's going about it the wrong way, but I do think there's a, a, a real sort of hint of that in the air. Well, we'll be talking about presidents and their legacies uh, uh, coming up in the next segment. Uh, President Biden says American democracy is in danger. Is it? I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> there was a suggestion by some 
that maybe it was nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. To the US now, where President Biden has used his State of the Union address to warn that freedom and democracy are under threat in the US. The president referred to my predecessor 13 times, attacking Donald Trump on everything from Russia to the Capitol riots and COVID. Now... It's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. Joining me now to react to that is former Donald Trump advisor, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, what's your reaction to the State of the Union address? What did you make of that? Well, first things first, it's been far too long, Douglas. Thank you for having me. And I just want to express my appreciation on behalf of lots of people for you being a, a single-handed media enterprise and doing more real journalism than most other companies, whether it's while rockets are flying in Israel, or whether you're challenging people who hate Western civilization. So God bless you, Douglas. Oh, thank um, you. Nevertheless, you have to answer the, the question. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't a State of the Union. It was a state of the grumpy old man, and it was a campaign speech, as you correctly noted. He mentioned my former boss 13 times. Now, this is a constitutionally mandated requirement of the incumbent president every year to give a state of the union. How are things going right now? Instead, he ranted, he spoke gibberish about the COVID vaccine curing cancer, and then he attacked my boss 13 times. But worse than that, he compared half of the nation to the Confederacy. And again, this is the man who on his inauguration day spoke of the promise of bringing Americans back together and unifying us. Instead, he divided us more than he ever had. So this is a desperate old man pumped full of whatever drugs they gave him so he could give that speech. Who knows that right now President Trump is trouncing him in the polls and the primary results tell you one thing, Douglas. The Americans desperately want my former boss back in the White House and to eject this senile old excuse of a politician. Well, well, first of all, by the way, uh, uh, Joe Biden did mention in his speech that uh, Donald Trump isn't much uh, younger than him. <laughs> it's not the age that matters. But when I was in the White House, I, I often used to get asked, uh, Seb, when the president's uh, tweeting at 4 a.m., that's you, right? And I used to say, no, I need to get some sleep. This man may be 25 years older than me, but if I had a mere quarter of his energy, I'd be a happy man. The, 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 the nature, I don't know what it is, the German blood, the Scottish blood, he's indefatigable. Just keep up with his 
not only his, having, his, his rallies, but the constant abuse and the attacks from the deep state, the, face that, the, the fact that he's facing as the leader of the opposition right now, 730 years in prison. Why? Because he is the leader of the opposition. So no, it's, it's the age isn't the issue. The, the, mm -hmm. the question is whether you love America and whether you want to fix it and save it. And uh, President Trump is the latter. Let me uh, put a poll to you. There's a, there was a New York Times Siena poll earlier this week uh, that showed that if the presidential election in America was held today, Donald Trump would beat Joe Biden 48% to 43%. Yeah. I mention that because it seems to me that uh, since the, the polls are in Donald Trump's favour at the moment, uh, it seems to me that neither America nor the rest of the world is particularly prepared for Trump the return. Do you agree? It depends. It depends. So what the Trump phenomena truly represents is just part of a recrudescence, a, a, a rebirth of national sovereignty and this nowadays derisive term of populism, which I never understood why it was pejorative, because if you're popular, it means the majority of the people support your policies. But it starts with Nigel Farage and Brexit, then it goes to Donald Trump, then it goes to Maloney, then it goes to Milley and Bolsonaro. So, uh, the, you know, in, in, in the Oxford debate I was recently at, the motion before the House was, uh, this House fears the return of Donald Trump. And my answer was, yeah, the people who re fear the return of Donald Trump are the enemies of Western civilization, uh, like ISIS, like Putin, like the mullahs in Iran, like the cartels that are now smuggling 12,000 illegals across our border every single day. So, you know, if you love Western civilization, if you like America and want it to be great again, you're going to vote for President Trump. We live in a perverse age. Douglas, you've written, you know, a library on this. We live in the most perverse of ages where our elites hate their own countries and hate the, their own civilizations. Donald Trump is the antithesis of that. This is a man driven by one thing and one thing alone, love of nation. And those who like him love America. There is no Republican-Democrat divide. The old taxonomy of left and right is irrelevant. The question is, do you love the country or do you hate it? That's the division today. Let me put one final question to you, uh, Seb Gorka. Um, the, uh, I've just written my column in New York Post this morning about this question, but there is surely, is there not, um, a, uh, among other questions, a question hanging over Donald Trump if he does return to office, which is, Who's going to work for him? Now, of course, you did work for him, uh, but um, if you don't mind my saying so, quite a lot of people worked for him and they, they didn't all last as long as you. Uh, some uh, lasted, I think, about 24 hours. Um, I know that there are moves to actually get uh, staffers in at perhaps a lower level. Uh, uh, Heritage Foundation in Washington's looking at this and others. But what do you make of Trump's uh, ability to actually fill up the higher level positions, to fill up the cabinet? There are so many people who uh, came into his administration who he fell out with. Some of them, like um, Kayleigh McEnany, he didn't fall out with, but they left office and then he insulted them. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bad blood with a lot of people who could fill those positions. Do you think that if Donald Trump does actually return, um, he's going to be able to fill up these positions? Who's going to work with him? Well, I, I think this is the, the subject of a long discussion. Maybe we can get you on my national radio show, America First, here in the US. Um, but to be honest, and I've said this publicly on, on my show, this is beyond you know, having a fair and free election in November. This is my greatest concern. It is a question of personnel. A good friend of mine who hosts the, 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 uh, the show here in Washington, D.C. in the mornings said one of the greatest achievements of the left in the last generation is to make sure that decent people would never work in a conservative administration, especially a Trump administration. And I can tell you, it's not just um, the fact that we had fifth columnists and saboteurs at the highest level, including the then general, the, the, gen, the then uh, chief of staff, uh, John Kelly. But then you have the question of who would do this? Uh, I, I was fine with being attacked by the, the establishment and the media because, hey, I'm a proxy for the president. But when they came after my wife, and when one journalist wrote an opinion piece about my 18-year-old son in school, 
calling him out by name and using the word traitor in the headline. What kind of sane individual wishes to do that to their family? So uh, this is a great concern to me. Yeah. Uh, the good news is we've got 330 million people. Uh, we should be able to find at least the 4,000 presidential appointees who know what they're doing, are patriots, and are prepared to put up with the calumny. Um, but it will be tough, and it is my greatest concern. But first things first, priorities. Let's get him over the finishing line and start to make America great again once more. Thank you very much, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, former advisor to former President Donald Trump and perhaps next President Donald Trump. Thank you. <laughs> Still with Thanks, me buddy. are Claire Pearsall and Esther Cracker. Uh, just to come to you, Claire, I mean, I come back to that poll I cited there from earlier this week. This is a New York Times poll that shows that if the election were to happen in the US and it's Biden versus Trump, Trump wins. Just to bring this home a bit, I mean, Britain isn't prepared for a Trump presidency, are we? I, th I mean, it depends what state the UK is going to be in and who is... Well, assuming we're still here time. and all that sort of thing. You know? But also, <laughs> we have the small matter of an election coming up at the, uh, some point, whether it be May, whether it be October. So we don't know who's going to be in power. OK, here, I, here's I, a I, wild I, guess. Here's a wild <laughs> guess. I didn't have £1,000 uh, like Piers and Rishi, <laughs> but I'll bet you £10. I'll bet Ooh. you £10 that Labour wins. OK, okay so, yeah. Keir Starmer is in number 10 Downing Street <clears throat> by December this year and Donald Trump is entering the White House yeah. again. Yeah, How perfect. does that relationship look? I think it looks pretty bad. Hmm. I really do. Um, I think it's incumbent upon America to put the right team of people around him and I think that that is probably slightly more important, that he has those individuals around him that will be able to make hmm. this operation work, put him out there as the front runner, but also just to back up with the policy ideas, which he does have. And I'm no great fan of President Trump, but he set out to do certain things and he delivered on those. Mm. And I think he needs to be praised to do, you know, for doing that. I Esther, actually, what do you think? I, I am going, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I suspect <laughs> that the Tories' best bet is to have the election in December, after the American election. Because mm. most of Britain will be looking <clears throat> that, yes, OK, we're, Westminster's run by a bunch of incompetence, but... Britain looks a lot better under a Rishi Sunak and Trump presidency than it does under a Keir Starmer and Trump presidency. And so I think it's a huge gamble, but it wouldn't make a difference if Biden wins four more years, whoever is in, in, in mm. Downing Street. Yeah, but it, it does yeah. make a difference who, who, who if Trump is in office. Yes. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, I, <laughs> I, I do think Trump's comeback is, is, is incredible because I can't believe how much the Democrats have stuffed it up. That's yeah. why, for Haven't me, they it, just, it's absolutely yeah. so incredible. I mean, this man is up uh, over the margin of error yeah, yeah, yeah. in virtually eight of the nine competitive states that yeah. he needs to win. How do you explain that? How do you explain it? Well, I, it's utter incompetence by the, the, by the Biden administration. Is it just that? Well, because in the last few years, seven million illegal, unvetted migrants. I, I have to stress the word unvetted because we don't know who these people are. Yeah, yeah. They have crossed the southern border and have disappeared into the underbelly of American society. Inflation is up. Job security, uh, insecurity is up. How do you justify these things? and then turn around and say, oh, but the other guy is worse. We didn't have these problems under the other guy. Well, Joe Biden's line on that is that he's created a record number of jobs since coming into office. But what he always forgets to say is that since the historic low exactly. of COVID. Yeah. It's always very easy if you, if you pull that one. What but people... politics isn't attractive uh, to most people, so I think there's going to be a problem getting people uh, into... It's working into um, the White House. But good I people. don't... Yeah, good people. And I don't like this assumption. And Seb Gorka said so many of the little bits and pieces of the by, by, uh, of the Trump presidency, you know, you make America great again, and patriots. And it's this assumption that you do not love your country unless you support Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah. Mm. I find that very hard to believe that most people in America would think like that, but clearly the majority at the moment do. Mm. He Donald is Trump saying needs to do a lot of soul-searching. Um, yeah, because he does. I, I think, I think He needs to do what? A lot of soul-searching. He needs to go to therapy, like Harry. I was going to say, I, I, I've never heard Can a less imagine? likely yeah, he, suggestion. Well, well, because the thing is, he, he will come. There will come a point where he, the, the magnitude of what he's managed to achieve again will, will dawn on him. Yes, yeah. I managed to get back into the White House. Fine. Um, who are you going to have around you to make America great again? And, that, and that's it's the a problem. Huge isn't it? It's huge getting the huge right question. people into the jobs and having a much more organised team. The yeah. most most people, as I say, as in the New York Post this morning, most people who ended up working for Donald Trump find themselves 
A, unemployable afterwards, B, insulted by their former boss, and, uh, you know, I've always said about Trump that, I mean, uh, you know, he expects intense loyalty from people mm -hmm. towards him, but people are loyal to people who are loyal back. Exactly. Yes. And if you look at the way in which he's friends. talked about everyone, from whether it was Ann Coulter on the campaign yeah. trail, who yep. started a bad mouth, to Kayleigh McEnany, who'd been incredibly loyal to mm -hmm. him uh, as his spokesperson, and then he, he just dismissed, or whether it's Rex Tillerson, who he, yeah. he, he, he hired, fired, and then called as dumb as a brick. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of an assault course working mm -hmm. for uh, Donald J. Trump. Anyway, coming up and talking of assault courses, more of today's mad stories, including the school dropping tributes to Francis Drake and Sir Walter Raleigh because they aren't inclusive enough. I'm Douglas Murray, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got to laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Douglas Murray and you're with Talk TV. A school in Devon has been criticised for removing house names dedicated to the likes of Sir Walter Raleigh because of their so-called controversial past. Head teacher of Exeter School, Louise Simpson, scrapped the names of two British explorers because she said they no longer, quote, represent the values and inclusive nature of the school. Here to chat through this and more of today's stories is Becca Hudson, head of news for the news movement. Becca, thanks so much for being with us. So, uh, uh, Walter Raleigh and uh, other uh, former heroes, uh, do they represent our past or not? 
I think this is a really interesting story, isn't it? And we see it increasingly, um, whether it's road names, the use of public space, um, you know, do we use that to sort of memorialize things from the past or do we sort of use it instead to celebrate where we are currently and our sort of progressive ambitions as a society? Um, and very clearly, the, um, the head teacher of, of Exeter School has decided that, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh and his connections with, um, you know, the colonization of North America and the probably less than brilliant treatment of the indigenous people there. Um, and obviously Francis Drake, who was one of um, the, one of Great Britain's kind of greatest and earliest slave owners, doesn't reflect um, the values of her school. And I think, you know, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a necessary conversation to have. I think kind of arbitrarily just sort of changing names and not explaining why doesn't really prove much, doesn't really, um, you know, have much value, does it? I but think explaining to her pupils, to the community, why uh, why these people no longer reflect the values of that school, I think is a really interesting thing to do. Um, I think just kind of renaming them after Woodlands, I think was her suggestion, feels um, a little bit inane. Um, but I think absolutely, I think, you know, if you know, especially if you're a fee paying school, you've got to uh, appeal to the broadest possible uh, number of clients, haven't you? And if that means kind of being inclusive and reflecting the fact that, you know, Britain has moved on and, you know, we have a very different opinion to uh, um, of our sort of colonial behaviours um, now, I, I think is a good thing. But, I mean, uh, Sir, Walter, Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake, I mean, they weren't celebrated in this country and they weren't commemorated in many, many places across the land, including uh, this school in Exeter. They weren't included there uh, because they owned slaves. They weren't celebrated because they owned slaves. They weren't celebrated because of anything to do with the treatment of Indigenous uh, uh, Americas, they, well, they were celebrated because they were heroic men who set out to sail in incredibly dangerous conditions and uh, and helped discover the world. And uh, I mean, surely there's a, you know, there's, there's some way of putting this into context, isn't there? I think, I think contextualising it, it, it would be really, really important. So I think explaining why, um, you know, of course we can celebrate them for their commendable bravery. And of course we know an awful lot more about the world now than we did then thanks to them, um, of course. But equally kind of, you know, the role they've played in history, um, you know, when we reflect on how we behaved in North America and in fact across most of the world uh, during our colonial ambitions. Um, I think, you know, we do feel we do feel very differently about that. And for lots of people who now call Britain their home, you know, that history isn't something that's necessarily something very positive or to be celebrated and actually reflects, you know, really kind of very dark and harrowing passages in lots of countries' history. So, you know, you're right. They're not there because they were involved in the slave trade um, or, 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 or treatment of indigenous people. But we understand that that was part of what they were doing. And as a country, you know, we now reflect on that um, as that not being something to be hugely proud of. And instead, there are lots of people, um, you know, in the last hundred years plus, who have made incredible contributions to a proudly progressive and inclusive society in this country who maybe would be better honoured, uh, you know, by the well, you know, the well-bred, well-heeled folks at Exeter School. But why, why, why does everyone, why, why are we only allowed to celebrate people who are what you call progressive? I mean, um, most people in history didn't share our views that we have now. Uh, because they lived in the past. I mean, people in the future will probably think that we're kind of nuts on a whole range of things, but we'd, we'd hope to at least be treated in a fair light, wouldn't we? It's a, it's a very strange thing to sort of rename everything about ourselves because they happen not to fit with us. Um, anyhow, I'm yeah, going to well, stick with us, Becca. I'm going to come to my panel quickly. But um, Esther, do you, I mean, uh, I, I didn't realise this uh, Exeter school uh, head said was hoping to replace the names of these heroes with uh, Woodlands. And personally, I think it's better to bring up young men and women aspiring to the bravery of Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake rather than aspiring to be a bluebell wood. But what do you think? Well, exactly, yes. Uh, <laughs> or an oak tree. An oak tree. <laughs> I mean, that is where I draw the line. Honestly, that is ridiculous. Really, Woodlands? Anyway, um, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm really uh, sick of this idea that we can somehow be pious by holding mm. people of the past to our standards. It's cl completely impractical, it's completely ludicrous, but I also think it's, there's something deeply anti, both anti-Western and anti-British about it because this doesn't happen anywhere else. Right. You yeah. can't go to India and be like, you cannot, uh, 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 I don't know, commemorate this this uh, significant uh, figure of your past because of X, Y, and Z. Z. You can't yeah. go to Nigeria and do that. You can't go to, so for some reason, you can't do that anywhere else. You certainly yeah. can't do that with most Chinese countries, or the Most rest. countries are proud of their Exa past. Exactly. Yeah. Even, and and might very well, uh, 
accommodate conversations looking at the legacy of these mm. people and talking about the positive and negatives, fine. But for some reason, it's an obsession here in mm. Britain and in America. Yeah. And yeah, I don't yeah, understand yeah. why. Yeah. It uh, is. Yeah. And, and history, by its very nature, is messy. It is complicated. And most it people realise that. Yeah. Absolutely, Most but people know you that. have to talk about it. You cannot deny that the past has happened. No. You have a conversation so you don't make the mistakes mm. again. I mean, my son's school, can I give you some examples of house Please. names? At my son's school, Duke of York's Royal Military School, Walsley, Hague, Wellington, Kitchener. I mean, wow. that's soon, that's soon to go. These are, it will soon go. These no, are solid no. names. Absolutely. They will not go anywhere. They are very, very proud of their military history, yes. and rightly so. Yeah, absolutely. One other story whilst uh, I've got you, Becca. The, uh, we've got... Um, this, is, this is a pretty astonishing one, in my view. But, uh, woke clothing brand, The North Face, is offering customers 20% off, but only if they complete a racial inclusion course. Uh, 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 are you eager to get 20% off at the North Face? Well, it's very expensive. Uh, so I think it's a very <laughs> a canny move. Um, I, I think we might disagree on this one, but I, I think this is a, a, a jolly idea. You know, wealth, very, very wealthy people are paying hundreds and hundreds of pounds for those god-awful outdoor jackets. And I think if uh, North Face can incentivize them to understand a little bit more about the experiences of people who don't have, uh, uh, you know, the inclination to spend that much money on clothes and learn a bit more about the world around them, I think it's great. And I think, you know, very recently, there was a, a very live conversation about sort of the countryside being this kind of predominantly white place and lots of different communities not feeling, um, you know, like they're reflected and like they, you know, I can call um, our countryside their own. And so I think, you know, this does, I think this is a, you know, a great effort from, from North Face, and even if it is a cynical marketing ploy, you know, if it gets a few more people thinking about how to be a slightly more inclusive um, and progressive place, my favourite word of the morning, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Becca. Still with me are uh, my panel, Claire Pearsall and Esther Kraku. Um, I, um, I despair of that discussion about the countryside, that one just... Oh, if yeah, all yeah, yeah. of the ones... Again, yeah. unique unique to Britain. You can't no. go to Korea and be like, oh, this place... So many Asian-looking people here in Korea. It's only in Britain. <laughs> it's it's incredible. I, I, honestly, I feel like an outsider watching through, like, like, right. through a looking yeah. glass and just thinking, am I in the right place? I, just what, say, I, don't, I don't think the countryside cares where you come from. No. I don't think the trees are looking and they're going, oh, look at that. Oh, look. That's the so moss has words. a certain yeah. bigotry about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. The buttercups yeah. are revolting. Also, and this won't like work that. as no, well. Of course it won't Because work. The, I, I don't know, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with this. There's a certain bias in psychology and there's a specific term for it. But when you uh, incentivize people to, to um, mm -hmm. financially to, to answer surveys and stuff like that, they say the things that they think you they want you to say. Yes. Yes, so, you're going to so get a massive exa exactly. result. Exactly. So yeah, it's actually yeah, not yeah. going to work as well. It's a waste of and money. also, twenty percent off very expensive coat isn't really that much. Yeah, no. Let's be brutally honest. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I have never bought anything from the North Face, and I'm not going to pass a purity test in order to buy something in the future. <laughs> uh, but that might not come as a surprise. Uh, one final story, whilst I have you: uh, uh, vegan protesters are accusing the RSPCA. Yes, I said that right. The RSPCA of supporting gas chambers for pigs. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, I need more information. I don't understand. Well, well the RSPCA oh, yes, isn't yeah. RSPCA enough. I don't know. Do you, do you know about this, Becca? It's... it's uh... yes, no, it's, it's an astounding story. So um, a, a bunch of kind of, you know, right on vegans um, have attacked an abattoir in, uh, in West Sussex because ah. they are gassing pigs before they're being slaughtered, um, which uh, the RSPCA sorry, which this group have argued, you know, is, is deeply inhumane. Um, you know, the EU and other countries don't gas their pigs with CO2 before they slaughter them. Um, and the RSPCA have endorsed this abattoir as being, you know, a place where, you know, you, you're buying kind of very ethical um, yes. uh, meat it, when obviously... Isn't you, the you idea, can't. exactly, isn't the idea that, that, that therefore the pigs don't feel any, uh, any pain? Well, they would argue that they feel a lot of discomfort because you're, you're effectively being being gassed um, and that there are more effective ways of stunning pigs. I'm now an expert in, in slaughtering animals as a vegetarian. You learn all sorts doing this show, don't you? <laughs> um, there are more, they, they would argue there are more ethical ways of stunning them prior to them being slaughtered. Um, and they want, the EU have invested a lot of money in researching this. They would like us to follow course. Um, but at the meantime, they think that the RSPCA should not be slapping their logo of endorsement over products that come out of abattoirs like this because of the, the distress of the animals go through have you, have you, uh, have you, ever, have you ever looked have you ever tried to go to an abattoir so uh, very quickly i tried to go to an abattoir and i tried to find some in my area and the reviews comments were spammed by vegans 
um, it's calling it a place of death and horror. So I don't. I think they're they're upset with the, the whole existence of the abattoir, not just yeah. the gassing of the pigs. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound great, the gassing of pigs. But then, I mean, if you go to the dentist and you have to go under anesthetic, you're being gassed as well, aren't oh, yeah. you? But I, I, mean, think, you know, the, I think vegans wouldn't like pigs to be slaughtered in the first place, so they're going exactly. to find an excuse for every kind of abattoir anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there we go. There's um, there's a nice way to end the show with uh, gassing pigs and uh, North Face purity tests. Anyhow, uh, we've come to the end of the show. I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for joining me and thank you to my panel, especially to Claire Pearsall and Esther Cracker. Coming up is Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips. You've been watching and you've been listening to Talk TV. Have a good day. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. floor.